No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today, long away, the Drake Bell podcast. How you doing, man? What's happening, man? Good to be here. Chilling, man. I'm just uh, excited to to even be part of, you know, I feel like people have this conception of like how grown ass adult actors should behave. Yeah. And I always like seeing people go a little bit outside of it. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely a, oh, wow. Hey, check that out. That's much better <laughs> like that. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, I don't know. I I think there's there, there's some truth to that. Definitely, like some preconceived, uh, you know, perceptions of. Cause don't what? don't you see how? Well, in my opinion, like when people see you sort of like going out and just like interacting as like a regular dude and like doing fairly normal shit, like going backstage to a rap show or you know going <laughs> doing podcasts and stuff, it seems like people kind of get geeked up off of it because in their mind. Someone who's been a professional actor for such a long time should not be engaging with the populace in such a way. And so then they get real excited when people actually are like willing to show that they're just regular people. I guess. I mean, I, I haven't thought about that. I just do what I, what I do. But I think that, yeah, I guess that is the, the case. Yeah. I don't know. I just see people so excited when I see you like, like just anything about you, like you doing like fairly ordinary human being well, stuff. I mean, and people I, are like, that, yes. that definitely gets the most like reactions when I post on whatever social media or anything like that. If I'm just doing some, you know, I don't know, like, if, like, like hanging out with pump or something that's out of the ordinary, I guess right. you'd say like something that's like, you know, Oh yeah, exactly. Like why, what's, what's he doing at a Zan show? Like, right. Why is he up on stage and hanging out with Diablo and all that stuff? Like, I guess it is kind of, yeah, more interesting that it's like, what, you know, why like, is this guy from Nickelodeon? Doing I feel that? like you could post a photo eating a bowl of cereal with your shirt off, <laughs> and people would be like, "Yes, he's a regular dude." Yeah, stars. They're just like us. <laughs> exactly. Do you want to introduce like us? Yeah, this is my buddy Diablo. Actually, I'm working on. Oh, another on Diablo. The, I mean, wow. excuse me, Diablo. I'm Diablo. sorry. Fucking King well, Cosby. we have a Diablo as well. No, 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 no. I'm. That was a Floridian slip because I was just talking about Diablo. Oh. This okay. is King Kazi. I met you before a couple times with Diego. Okay. Like oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, we're making actually a record together right now. So right. that's what we're in the studio right now, making new music and stuff. So oh, that's fire. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people probably don't know that you're like sort of looped in with the the Zanarchy wave and everything. Yeah, it kind of just happened out of nowhere. I just w started following his music and all of the, you know, like Pump and all these guys and everything, and I just really dug what they were doing because I don't know. I've never really been a huge a huge fan of hip hop, but like everything that's just been coming out recently is. I don't know, I grew up on like punk rock and like, I grew up in Orange County and was like into skating and all this, this stuff. And this stuff that's happening now sort of, I don't know, it kind of coincides and collides with that stuff that I grew up on and kind of get more of that like punk rock feel. Right, so hip hop has kind of had like a punk rock moment over yeah. the past couple of years with a lot of dudes, like when you look at somebody like Pump or Yachty, they come out and they are really like rejecting the traditional structure of what hip hop is. And they're just sort of jumping in and being like, nah, fuck it, I'm gonna do my own thing, even if it's more based on melody or my voice or being yeah. funny or whatever. And it's like that, they've able, you know, somebody like Eminem is the best rapper in the world. Lil Pump is not maybe the best rapper in the world, but you know, has a certain like, the same way that like punk was not like as talented musically as classical rock or whatever. Yeah, and it's like, I don't know, I go to these shows and I don't know. I see all the people coming to these shows and the way that they're performing and everything. And I, I don't know. It reminds me of more of the Sex Pistols than like, I don't know. What, what? Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. I don't want to throw any names, but, but it, no, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I just see like more like, oh, fuck, this is like Sid Vicious. You know, this is more rebellious and like, I don't know. It's just cool. You know, that's actually really interesting because I, I felt like I never really had that much confidence that I would be able to like create content or work within hip hop until I got to the point where I started meeting like young 19 year old rappers who were just punk rock. Like yeah. they were dirty. They didn't give a fuck. A lot of these early dudes I was even like smoke perp is like one of the first like early rappers I interviewed and stuff. And he was like more of like, just like a skater kid, just sort of hanging out at shops on Melrose or something like that. That's how I met him. And like, Previous to that, I'd always sort of had this idea. And now I really understand that even the most gangster rappers, even the rappers who wear the most, gu most Gucci, no shots, are uh, basically regular people. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's what, like, you know, just kind of drove me to this that this music, I guess. I don't know. It's just kind of, like, connected me more because, like, I grew up, you know, as a skater kid, as, like, in Orange County surfing. and Where in Orange County? In uh, Garden Grove. Oh, nice, yeah, nice. In, like, Huntington, Newport area and all yeah. that. Yeah, I lived in Long Beach for, like, 
three, four years. Oh, okay. So, so I got a little taste of. So yeah, so it's the same same kind of vibe. You know what I mean? So. What kind of bands were you into when you were first going to punk shows and shit? I mean, like all the like the local bands that no one would have ever heard of, oh, but okay. it, but people who I would be into the like Op I like the Op Ivy mm. era and the Rancids and you know. That sucks. I miss that. I would have liked to live in California for that shit. Oh, dude, that Orange, been Orange been. County. Because I grew 90s. up listening to Operation Ivy and shit, but it was so far away. And Sublime you know? yeah. and like all the shit. It was. Dude, I mean, no doubt, and all this, it was, like, right there in Orange County. I mean, Orange County was just the fucking place to be in, in the 90s as a kid, man. That's badass. Yeah, just the music that was coming out of there. It was just all ska, punk rock, and everybody was, like, rude boy or skater or punk. It was just, like... Which one were you? Cool. Dude, I was everything. <laughs> I, I, went from, I went from, like, rockabilly to ska to punk to just whatever was... Me whatever too. Like in, into, in, man, in, man. like, a few years, it was, like... Punk, ska, hardcore, death metal, black metal. I just like had to experience, experience like every genre in this short period of time before yeah. I eventually was like, dude, nah, I would, rap's I would better. walk around. I would walk around in like a suit and tie and be like, dude, I'm a rude boy for life. Like it's ska music, it's the special selector, like rude boy for life. And then all of a sudden, I heard rockabilly music, and I was like, oh shit, these greasers are so rad. Like the pompadour hair and they're all their tattoos and all this stuff and everything, you know. And then it just progressed, and then it just changed. It's just like. You know, but yeah. Orange County was just a hotbed of just so much different, you know, type of uh, creative music and stuff. So. You ever done a kickflip? Have a kickflip on, yeah. on, a, on, a, on skateboard? a skateboard? Yeah, for sure. Okay, good. Because like Jonah Hill has sort of like taken this role in skateboarding, and a lot of skaters have been very into like trying to document and find evidence that he has skateboarded. And they can't find any evidence of him skateboarding. So and he's not a skater. I mean, it's just like it's more of a meme to Where be did honest. He grow up? I don't know, but I was like somewhere in New York, right? I, I don't think. Know. I mean, you can't grow up in Orange County and not skate. Yeah, yeah for sure. But I don't know. It's like it's he like, he's had quotes like where he's like talking about like how much skateboarding like influenced him when he was younger, and it's it's more of a meme. There's this skateboarder named Wecking Ball who sort of like is constantly like pushing the issue like if you skated, where's the footage? We need to see clips, man. And it's just yeah. like it's super funny because it's like he's a fucking grown ass man. I don't really <laughs> give a shit if he has skateboard clips, but it is funny and to not hold everybody him. Everybody like, was a, running around with like I don't have any footage of me skating. Like exactly. I didn't have any. Yeah. Also, not back when we were skating, like we didn't have iPhones, we didn't have all that stuff. Like no, and also we didn't have money for a freaking camcorder. It was like a thousand dollars when we were kids. And you know? the mentality of like, oh, I did a good trick, so therefore I need to put it on social media and like, and, or well, film it in uh, any way I is mean, super new. Also, think about like when we were skating, where would we have posted it? We wouldn't. Right. We would have like sent it into America's Funniest Home Videos if we like fell or something. Like, there's nowhere to post. We didn't have social media. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have YouTube or anything. So that would have like, been badass. Yeah, it's like, why do we have? Of course, we're not gonna have footage of us skating, like, unless <laughs> unless we were like try, kids trying to make skate videos, you know, which a lot of my friends were. But were I you wasn't. interested in acting and everything, even while you were going through those sort of like grow, growing years? I was like years? simultaneously acting at the same time as as all that. So yeah, I was living in Orange County, but I was like driving back and forth every day to L.A. just to you know audition and then eventually work on Amanda shows and Drake and Josh and whatever. What age did working. you start acting? <laughs> Five. Five. Yeah. Wow. So your parents yeah, were like on it from day one? Well, I don't know. I was like, honestly, my parents, they just like, they got divorced. My dad needed something to do. He was putting me in Little League and I I wasn't having fun doing that. I was having more fun like entertaining the guys on the bench and um, wasn't really into sports. And so, uh, but I would, I would go home and I'd try to you know, impersonate the people I'd see on TV, and I grew up on a lot of old stuff like you know Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin and all all these all these old um, vintage guys, everything in black and white. And so I'd like try and impersonate them. And my dad was like, "Dude, maybe my kid's more into maybe she get into show business or something." And I'd always try and like, you know, play guitar and sing and all this stuff. So he's like, "All right, he's obviously not into sports." So, um, so then we just we didn't we were just flying blind. Like he didn't we weren't in the industry. We didn't know anything. We. Luckily, we only lived an hour from L.A., but we just kind of were like, all right, let's try this and go find agents or whatever the fuck. Yeah, that, that explanation actually makes it sound like much more of a reasonable decision to get your kid into acting because it's kind of like, well, if they don't like football and they seem like they're interested in the arts, then it seems like a reasonable thing to do. I think a lot of people come up with this whole like idea in their head of how it must take place where the parents are just sort of like have this big money plan from day yeah. one and the kids being completely or, or exploited. Or they wanted to be a star, so that, but they couldn't, so their kid's going to be... No, if my dad had his way, I would have been 
you know, I would have been a pitcher for the New York Yankees. Mm. Like, that's what he wanted. He would have, you know, my cousin ended up actually being a pitcher for the New York uh, Mets and, oh, wow. and the San Diego Padres and all this stuff. One of the greatest closers of baseball recently, but not me, not me. Mm. I got into music and, and entertainment and I was the only one like in my family, my whole, my nobody else's. So it was not anybody's like, oh yeah, this is what, this is what my kid's going to do. It just kind of like, you know, he's like, all right, yeah, you're going to be a great baseball player and I'd be out you know, I'd be doing crappy in practice, and then they'd send me out in the outfield, and kids don't hit that far, so I'd just sit out. You know, I'd sit in the outfield, and he's like, "Okay, all right, you're not you're not a baseball player." You know? That was like my goal during any baseball game when I was a kid. Is like, damn, if I fuck up, then they're gonna put me on the bench, and then I don't have to do anything. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I wanted to be doing was yeah. nothing. It was either that or outfield, and these kids they can't hit that far, so you're just like, dope. I don't have to do anything for the next two hours. Right. Yeah, that was a great part about the outfield is that there wasn't a lot to do out. There there yeah <laughs> so were you interested in music even before you started to get into like going to punk shows and shit like that yeah totally i mean my dad grew raised me on music you know what i mean like i i was elvis and the beach boys and the Beatles. all all the good music was always in my house you know right. and then i just like it just i just became infatuated with it like obsessed with music and then started playing guitar when i was like nine or ten years old and then it just you know, that became like an extension of me. I couldn't put the damn thing down. You know, I remember the first time I heard Pantera, probably in like 1997, and I was fucking horrified. Like, I really felt like I had just like been like violently attacked through my earlobes because, or your drums, I suppose, because you know, I just had never heard anything like that. And, and like, I have multiple memories of like the first metal bands I heard, the first hardcore bands where I was just like, what the fuck? Like, this is crazy. Really didn't even know what to make of it. Yeah, I mean, like, vulgar, dis vulgar display of power is, like, when you put that record on, it's just like, what the f and if Even not, bands yeah. that are hard now, like, you listen to hard bands now, and I mean, there's some really great ones, but some that are like, oh, yeah, listen, you know, kid, you know, young people will be like, oh, listen to this hardcore band I'm listening to, and I'm just like, dude, have you ever heard of Pantera? Like, have you ever, <laughs> like, just put, put this, go home, listen to this record, and, you know, but yeah, the, the, and the thing about Pantera is the musicianship is out of control. Mm. I mean, you know, Dimebag, all these guys are just like such ripping players and they're just virtuosos like musically, you know. There's a band that I just saw recently. Have you heard of um, uh, Mashuga? Oh, yeah. Dude, I just saw them live at the, at the Wiltern. And it was like the most face melting show I'd ever seen. Like I've been to hundreds and hundreds of concerts and every type of band, heavy, whatever. And this band was just like, and it was the same thing that was impressive about them was like, not just could they just be loud and hard and tight, but dude, they're, they're just virtuoso. It was like listening to Beethoven or Bach or something. You know? A lot of those metal like bands unreal. are, yeah, they're crazy underrated in terms of just the actual musicianship. Yeah. And a lot of people who listen to them, their kind of gut reaction is like, this is just noise. Yeah, yeah, exactly, so, exactly. I, I remember seeing Cradle of Filth in 1997 at the Worcester Palladium, and I'm just like, a 13 year old just like jaw dropped watching these guys play guitar, just like, how the fuck are you moving your hand that fast? Yeah. Dude, I, it, it's so funny. They, the, well, we were talking to the guys from Ashuga, and they had to start uh, playing to a metronome because the drummer would play so fast that the guitar players, they couldn't do the licks so fast because their hands would cramp up. That's how fast they're playing. It's just like so many notes. It's just crazy. You're like, how, how are you playing so fast that your hands, like, can't continue it's fucking that is it's crazy, crazy. And it's crazy to think too how different the trajectory of a band is just in the sense that they you know we're talking about Mashuga. i'm pretty sure that they've been together for like at least like 15 years oh yeah and they're still going and they're mm -hmm. still killing it whereas like a rapper to still have a career 15 years after you start is very very difficult only a select few will be able to do it yeah that's i mean and you got to be massive like I don't know. I think Pump turned the turned the corner here with that with the new uh, the Kanye thing, the Kanye video, and all this stuff. And then obviously going to jail was the most brilliant thing ever. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's insane when you think about Pump because he is basically like coming from like an underground rap scene. Yeah, and now he has a song with Kanye, and I've, a lot of people like have completely forgot about the fact that Pump was like. 
kid playing underground shows in Florida like two years ago. That's how like, I met like him. Le- like, a year and a half I ago, pretty much. I was going to say almost less than that, man. When I just saw him recently, it was like, we were talking, it was, it was only like seven months since Gucci Gang actually dropped, and you're like, what the, f-? like, all this has happened, and you've and, and he's like, yeah, only like two or three months before Gucci Gang dropped had he even started rapping. Mm. It was like, it's like Zan, like these guys just fall into it, you know what I mean? It's and they have a hard time explaining why. Yeah. They're like, I don't, I mean, like, hey, because, you know, people who interview him are always trying to ask him, like, why'd you blow up? I'm fucking know. I'm low pump, man. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> I'm cool. I can't help it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. What? Uh, I feel like again, like talking about like you interacting on like a very like human or internet level. I feel like you really set the internet ablaze as soon as you decided to like interact with Pump's uh, fascination with your former co-star. Oh, uh, dude. I felt like that kind of set it off. They were just like, "Hey, man, I'll put in a word for you." I don't know. I. <laughs> I. <sighs> I, I wonder I have not talked to her about that. Mm. I don't know if she's seen it. I don't know. But it's funny, man. When I when I when I talk to him about it, he's like I thought he was just joking. I thought it was just like a total troll thing, but he really likes her. Right. <laughs> he's like really I'm like, dude, it's the only person he follows on Instagram and like all this stuff. It's Maybe it's funny. it's gone past being just a meme. And it, it's, it's way past that. Like I talk that's love. what I that's what I thought it was. It really was. There were stars in his eyes. Or hearts. Hearts in his eyes. When he was like, Oh man, you know, does she? Do you think she sees it? Do you think she sees it? I'm like, dude, I think everyone <laughs> in the world. Sees Imagine it. her comments. Yeah, they're all little pump fans. I remember totally. the, I went to the Harvard Instagram when he was following them for a while, and it was just the Har- like Harvard. I think had to turn their Instagram they, comments they, they, off. They must. I mean, so classic. I just, it's so funny that he would actually ask, like, "Do you think she sees? It? Do you That's think late. she sees it?" I'm like, dude. You have 10 million followers lit, and you constantly tell them to go and comment on her. <laughs> Instagram, yeah, I think she sees it, but who knows? I mean, maybe she doesn't go. She's she's a very simple girl, so who knows? Maybe she doesn't even read her comments. I mean, she's. Pro- I'm gonna go on a limb. Probably not that interested in a little pump. I no no knowing Miranda, and she's, I don't think that I don't think he's her type. She's quite a bit older than him too, which might yeah, be a big actually, part of the problem. Yeah. I keep forgetting that. I always see her as like, still as like my right. little sister. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, he's 18. She's, she's yeah. a bit older than him. That might yeah. be kind of a she's weird like part. Like 25 now. Yeah, but hey, maybe she'll go through some shit in her life. Like if you he, never know. She might pull an Amanda Bynes. And yeah. Like, you, you know, because that's what you got to do. You got to holler at a girl when she's at a moment of weakness. When something's yeah. really bad going on in her life, just be like, hey, yeah. I, I'm here for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> you need a shoulder to cry on? Right here. Crazy. I got some deltoids for you. Um, yeah, man. So, okay. When did you first start to feel like you were actually, like, making it in the acting world like i'm assuming you had quite a few years of just feeling like you were still struggling and still just sort of well i mean you're like a little kid but you know not necessarily being super successful when did you start to like hit, hit a stride dude honestly what's so funny is i was actually talking to josh about this the other day when that's we good to were hear. when we were on yeah yeah actually well, i mean that's the number one question that we're gonna have to get into is like people want you guys to have this like death match planned yeah well, even though if they watch any of your prior interviews they'd know yeah, no, there's such. no death match. There's no death match. We're, all, we're getting along and everything's fantastic. He's having a baby. It's going to be wonderful. You about bang my uh, line Which is after wild. This. It blows my mind. It's so crazy. Um, what was I saying? Just that you were talking to him the other day about... Oh, yes, about uh, how, you know, when we were working on Drake and Josh, it was just like... You know, there was no iCarly. There was no Victoria. There was no Nickelodeon hadn't had some big breakout success hit before us and then so when we were making the show it wasn't and it was actually and the time it was airing it wasn't like we didn't have that hey we're on big bang theory or hey we're on seinfeld like we're on a big successful show we were just on this like nickelodeon show that kids watch and whatever and it just it wasn't until you know, eight, ten years later, now recently, even more now, that in interviews people treat the show like it's Seinfeld or like mm. it's the Friends or like it's this groundbreaking, you know, show that happened. Uh, and it like the nostalgia and it, it's just crazy. So now when I go out and I walk around and I hang out, it's like, it's almost as if we were shooting the show now. Mm. It's crazy. So I don't Because so, it's like when you make a show for kids, 
the kids can't really be vocal about well they can now with social yeah. media but at the time it's like where's a kid really going to make his voice heard so yeah the Nickelodeon's happy it's pulling in ratings and stuff yeah. but you're not necessarily like seeing the ramifications and also I right? think I think at the time it was really viewed as like oh you were on a kids show mm. you know but now you know with iCarly and other other Nickelodeon and Disney shows that have come out that have done you know almost crossed over into you know they're getting just as much ra- in, as many ratings as network shows or they're just doing that you know it's sort of all just kind of blending together now so i don't know it's it's weird in in the past like 5 years we've seen more excitement and and love for the show and 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 yeah even though kids grow up but there's there's really no demographic it's crazy it's like there'd be a 6 year old who wasn't even alive when the show was airing and <laughs> there'll be a 30 Five year old who's you know was probably twenty when the show aired or something like that you know it's just crazy it's just there's no demographic it's 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 become Full House that, that, right. that's a good example because a six year old kid can probably watch it yeah. and they have no concept of like oh this is dated this has been is, out for yeah. a long time and we yeah. never did anything you know we never mentioned the Kardashians on the show <laughs> or we never mentioned any pop culture any references on the show that would go oh this show must be from that era or something you know mm. so. It's, um, yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's, How old were you when the show started? F- uh, 15 or 16. 15. So you already probably kind of felt like, like I'm doing a kid's show, but I'm 15. It, did it already occur to you that like there was an interesting no, dynamic going was, there? I thought it was so rad because I grew up on all that and Keenan and Kel. Right. And so I just was so stoked. I couldn't, I was like, dude, rad. I get to be like Keenan and Kel, like the stuff I grew up on. And like, you're kind of like so the cool. cool guy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's very <laughs> cool. But yeah, I mean, the show's basically become like, like full house, you know, it's, um, uh, there's, you know, it, 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 it it's it's a family show or it's geared towards a certain demographic, but everybody everybody grew up on it. You know, everybody's watched it, everybody's seen it. So it's it's like yeah. So the answer to the question is more recently. Yeah, I never really we never got to experience that like, hey, we're on a hit show. Right. Yeah. And I find it interesting too from like a stylistic perspective because I have been watching a lot of uh Drake and Josh over the past couple of days with my girl and I really grew up on like Saved by the Bell, Full House. And what I like about Drake and Josh and why I think it was making me laugh my fucking ass off last night and my girlfriend was sort of like like sort of almost seemed worried about some of the like really, really immature jokes that I was like howling laughing at. She's like, oh, right, you're a fucking child. Um, But there's something about, like, the speed and, like, I don't know. There's, like, an irreverence to the humor where so many of the situations that are playing out are so obviously not things that could happen in real life. And maybe I'm just viewing it as an adult like that and Saved by the Bell probably have plenty of stuff like that, too. But I don't know. It's, like, a lot. Like, I'm just very interested in, like, the progression of children or, in particular, like, teen shows and how adults relate to what kids want and in many ways dictate what kids want through what they decide is okay for a children's show well i i I don't know i'm surprised we got with a lot of the stuff that we got away with on the show because we were a kid's show you know i mean there's scenes where i would sit down on an uh, on an airplane and i get the middle seat and I get to sit between two hot girls, and I'm like, oh, all right, and I've never met them, and I turn to one, and I start making out with her, and then I look at the other one, and I shrug, and I start making out with her, and I mean, I'm like, this is, this is Nickelodeon, like, how, this is not MTV, this is not Showtime, this is not HBO, like, how is this okay? But all right, and it and it aired, and they mm. made it, you know. And the, so or, there was a lot of stuff catapulting that, a baby, a baby onto a, a roof. Yeah. Because to me, it's like there's probably a lot of six year olds watching this that don't have the mental fortitude to understand that this didn't really happen. This is just a show, and that the yeah. baby's fine. Yeah, you know. Some, but I mean, those conversations. God, I'd love to be a fly on the wall when they're making those decisions in the writing. Well, but you were super involved in like the creative process as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, they really let us, you know, Josh and I had such great chemistry that they just really let us fly a lot. You know, that's sometimes it would just be a line in the in the script. It'd be like, you know, Drake and Josh fight over a shrimp and there'd be like no dialogue, but mm. it'd be a full scene of us just improving and riffing and stuff like that. So Yeah. When was the decision made that you were going to be able to actually actually perform the theme song? 
Well, that's interesting, actually. Um, I got called one day. This was before we started the show. And they said, or it was from Dan Schneider, the executive producer. And he said, hey, uh, I want to have a meeting with you on Monday about how much or how little you want to use your music in the show. You know, do you want the, guitar, the kid to be a guitar player and singer? And, you know, or do you want to just have that completely separated from, you know, this and you do that on your own thing and you don't have, you know, this doesn't affect whatever. So I was like, yeah, great. Well, we'll have a we'll have a meeting on Monday. Cool. So that day, I called my buddy who I was writing a lot of music with at the time, and he goes, uh, and I and I said, hey man, I have this meeting on Monday, and I think I should we should we should try to write a theme song for the show because they were using some Lenny Kravitz song or something, and I wanted a song that, you know, if you're in the other room doing your homework or whatever, and you hear. Like, when you hear the, the Saved by the Bell theme song, you're like, oh, Saved by the Bell's on. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not wondering if it's a MTV show in a music video or in a commercial or if it's It's like whatever. an alert. It's like the bat signal yeah, being exactly. sent out. Everyone, get ready yeah. to laugh. A.C. Slater is going to be wearing some jeans with 10 buttons on them. Oh, my God. You're there gonna were laugh. so many buttons. Oh, that was, that's my favorite thing yeah. stylistically. That's, <laughs> that's how I, I learned to understand the world is that basically there are three types of men. Tall, blonde, smooth, popular guy, fucking dork. And then vaguely Hispanic male with a lot of buttons on his pants. <laughs> That's a very good observation. A jock. He's a bit of a jock, um, too. He played football and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, so anyway, so I, I, I told him uh, we should try to write a theme song. So I went, we went and uh, spent all, all uh, Saturday uh, just trying to write a theme song. So and, the theme is all you guys. Because it yeah. sounds so catchy that it's like, damn, like somebody must have like wrote part of this or something. No, it was just us on a whim, like. Going, all right, let's try to pitch a theme song. And we sat all day trying to think of, like, days go by. On the <laughs> and you wake up in the morning, and you're like, and nothing was sounding like a theme song. And I was like, you know what? Let's screw trying to write a theme song. Let's just not waste the day. It's already been, like, six hours. Let's write. Let's just write a song. So we started writing this, this melody and this, this riff and stuff. <clears throat> and uh, as we were writing it, I was like, hey, this actually sounds kind of cool. Why don't we make the lyrics go along with the uh, the story of the show, you know, not to a girl or not, you know, whatever. It could be like to your buddy or to your friend. Like I'm, I'm picking you up when you're down, and I get, so it'd be more like you know, because we were step brothers in the show, and we didn't like each other to begin with, but then we came to like each other, and uh, and so that's what we we tailored the lyrics around, um, and then we made a little one minute demo, and then that Monday I went into Dan and I uh, had the meeting and. I brought a little boom box with me, and he's like, oh, don't play it for me here. What if I, what if I hate this song? Like, I don't want to sit here and, you know, t I'm 15 years old, you know? And he's like, I don't want to tell this kid, like, you know, your song sucks, kid. Get out of here, you know? That's actually pretty smart, because I, I could probably save myself some grief by doing right? stuff like that. You know? like, let me review this in private yeah. so you don't see how much I hate it. But, of course, me being a 15-year-old kid, I was like, I'm not going to let you do that. I want an answer right now. And so I was like, no, come on, man. We're friends. Like, I don't, I don't care. Just If it sucks, you tell me it sucks. Then I'm like, okay, whatever. Uh, bummer. And, uh, and then we're still friends. I don't care. So I play him the song, and the minute ends, and he literally, like, gets up, grabs his, grabs the boombox, and he's like, that's amazing. And he walks out of the room, and I was like, what, wait, the, what, the, like, where's the meeting? We were having a meeting, and he walks out, and we were, wanna, we were working on a, uh, he was working on another show at the time. And so he walked out and walked onto his soundstage of the other show and started walking up to everybody and going, come here, guys, everybody, and he, he, he starts pressing plays, like, you want to hear the theme song to my new show? Hear the theme song to my new show? And I'm like, well, I guess we, <laughs> crap, I guess we got it, you know? And he turns around, he's like, I just got to convince Nickelodeon, but man, this is, this is the theme song. This is great. And so uh, it just, it, I mean, it was just completely by chance, you know, that we had the idea to even pitch it. Because I could have just talked to, to him and been like, yeah, I'm going to, uh, I'd love to be a musician on the show. Mm -hmm. And then they'd write songs, do whatever. But that, that gave me the ability to then have the trust of the network and of Dan and the writers and everybody to not have to go anywhere else to, for music for the show. So everything that I played on the show, I wrote and all the songs and everything. And they were also songs that I would simultaneously release on, on albums, which was great. So like, if you came to my concert, you know, it's Drake, it's not Drake, it's, you know, you're not Billy on TV and then Drake on, you know, when they come and see you in a concert and you're playing this music on the show, but then they come to see your original music and it's different and people are just like, what? 
you know, I got to showcase my own songwriting and my own music on the show. And then when you came to see the concerts, there was no disconnect. It was like, it just kind of like fit right together. So, so. so that's like pretty interesting that you were always able to sort of like use the show as like a vehicle to promote the music part of your life. But was your feeling like the music is the real me and the TV show is just like something I'm doing that's pretty cool for now? I mean, I love television because that's what I, I grew up on, classic TV, and just being on a soundstage and having, I don't know, just there's something about doing comedy that's just a lot of fun, you know? It's like, and it's hard, and getting someone to laugh, and doing, you know, doing clever banter back and forth between some, you know, I, it's, it's really great. But there is something that's more personal about the music, absolutely. It's just more, you know... It, I wrote it. I, I created it. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm in complete control of it. I'm not sitting there hoping somebody goes, "Oh no, you need to say this line this way," or "This is actually how I wrote it. I wanted it to be, be like this." And you know, am I doing this? Am I you know portraying this role the way that that producer, that director sees it? I get to get in the studio, and we just get to kind of like whatever we whatever we want to do, we do. And that's the cool thing about just being like independent, like, you know, we are right now and just not having any A&R, having direct connection with the fans like here, you know, it's like... It's the best. Yeah, we can just be like, hey, this is what we're working on. What do you guys think about it? And we have, there are A&R right there. And, you know, you can go live in the studio. People get excited about stuff and it just like... Um, so you were 15 when the show started? Yeah. But did you, so you kind of got to like, experience becoming a teenager before you were then started to become like a somewhat famous teenager Did i was you... on a show right before called the amanda show oh right but but it wasn't it, i mean it, it was a it was a big show it was it, it was a big show but i was not it was it was a big show for amanda mm. you know i mean we were we were in every episode and every sketch together but um i don't know it just didn't pop like you know people recognized me people knew me from the show but I don't know. And also, like I said, like, even when we were doing Drake and Josh when I was a teen, I mean, yeah, I'd get recognized if I went places where there were young people or families or, you know, if I was at an amusement park or, at a, you know, some restaurant or something. But it wasn't, you know, it's not, not like it is now. It's not, it was, uh, it was much more mellow, so. Yeah, because, like, I, I can go... If I go to some restaurant full of 40-year-old people, it's like I'm fucking anonymous. But as soon as I see an 18-year-old with some green dreads walking towards me, I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh all right, yeah, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's like, yeah. But so as like a teenager, though, did you, did you feel like shit got different or like in any way hard to manage because like the fame and shit that you, you had been accumulating no, that's up what to I that mean. point? that's what I mean. Like we, I, I was still, a, and there was no social media. Mm. You know, there was not any, and Twitter was you know, Twitter didn't even become relevant until we were already off the show. We were already done. And so there was no, like, man, if, I mean, I hate to say it, but like if, if, if I was, you know, doing the stuff I was doing as a teenager or now, I mean, it'd be all over TMZ and all over social media and all over Twitter. Somebody would have snapped a picture or a video and it would have been uploaded, but we didn't have to be as, as cautious and careful but that must have been a conversation then, you know? that was taking place like yo don't uh let anybody take a photo of you hitting a 10-foot bong at a party well yeah i mean we were just but it wasn't as it would it would like maybe get leaked to tmz it wasn't like somebody could snap a picture and it get uploaded to their twitter account and retweeted mm. immediately you know there was it was really like hey be careful walking out of a club because you're going to get caught by paparazzi or TMZ. Or, you know, if you're in this situation, there's going to probably be photographers there. You know, there was not like this be on your toes 24-7 at all times because one click mm -hmm. can just go up to, you know, I mean, it's so funny. And, and sometimes you don't even tell. Like the other day I was on, I was shopping and I go on Twitter and I'm like, that is just the weirdest picture of me. I'm, I'm, I was like, I don't know. I was looking at something weird, but I'm like laying on the ground. I'm in some weird fucking position. And 
It's like it's like retweeted like ten thousand times, and you're like, oh my god, oh, you, dude! Like, wait, just you sort of like laying there? Yeah, looking? but yeah, I was like shopping, and I was like, I guess I was like looking at somebody's shoes or something. But I'm like laying. Like, I, I don't know. It's just it's a position you don't want retweeted ten thousand times. Right, you but know I what mean, I'm saying? but like, there's so many things you do in a day to day. Yeah, and you don't you think know? about it, yeah. but it's just you know. But that's what I mean. Like back in the day, we didn't have to. I mean, YouTube didn't even exist. Mm. You know, I mean. I remember when my girlfriend called and it was like, hey, there's this new thing. I uploaded a video. You can post your own videos. And I was like, oh, it sounds like fun. I got to get back to work, you know? Yeah. And it just, we didn't have to deal with all of that that stuff, you know? I think about that all the time. I wish I had just known when YouTube first came yeah. out. What up, Cash? Yeah, my oh, guy. His other, Come people might have been wondering why there was a, a slot left open here, but yeah. here we are. What's good, bud? What's up, man? Adam. How are you? What's up? Cassius Clay. Nice to meet this you. This is after nice all our too. late nights in the studio. What's really? up, brother? Good to see you. We were just well, working late, last night. You guys yeah. out late night? Yeah, we were out. We were, we were in the studio last night. How late is late? Stuff. Actually, it wasn't too late. What, like 1.30? <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's Early not too late. Night. Dude, I went to New York recently, and I was going to do a session. And Okay, there's, there's pop sessions, and then there's rap sessions. Mm. And it's like two completely different worlds, dude. <laughs> I... A pop set, like when you work on music, and I thought it was just an LA, New York thing because you know, you work on a pop session, like cool, I'll, you know, come around at one o'clock in the afternoon, we'll start and we'll end around nine or ten o'clock at night, and you can go home and have your evening, go get some dinner, whatever. Mm. Non rap, we in this Dude, for keeps. No, <laughs> I go, I went, I actually have a uh, little mama uh, uh, on one of my new songs. And we, we worked on a project together, and I was, uh, we, she heard one of my songs. She's like, oh, man, this is awesome. I'm like, well, great, because you're about to be featured on it. Come get in the studio. And so I get to New York to uh, meet with her, and she's like, yeah, yeah, let's, let's hook up. I want to get in the studio. Let's do this. And, you know, this is like at noon. So I'm expecting like around at least 3 or 4 o'clock to get a phone call and be like, okay, let's get in the studio, maybe like an evening session, 7, 8 o'clock. Dude, all night goes by, all day, all day, all night. Now we're at dinner. It's 11.30 at night, and I'm talking to everybody at dinner. I'm like, man, this is a bummer. I thought I was going to be able to get in the studio, and, you know, I leave tomorrow. This sucks, you know, and then my phone rings, and I answer it, and she's like, hey, it's Mama. Uh, did you get you get a studio? I'm like, no, it's 11, it's midnight. <laughs> like, no. She's like, all right, well, I got a couple leads on some studios. They got, uh, book, at, book, at, uh, book, uh, book uh, you know, midnight to 4 a.m., and then we can go longer if we need to. Um, but here's the names of the studio. Like, just so professional and, like, bam, bam, bam. Like, it was one in the afternoon, and she was just booking a session. I'm like, Mom, it's midnight. Like, what are you talking about? And then uh, she's like, yeah. So then all of a sudden, I find myself in the studio. She rolls in around 1 o'clock, and then... And is just awake and ready to get to work and starts writing all these fire verses and going in and just knocking shit out. And I was like, what the hell? And we worked till like five in the morning and it was just normal. Yeah. I was like, what? This is. That's why I have such a hard time with the studio life because yeah. I wake up at about nine in the morning. And even to me, that seems incredibly early because I was getting up at noon for most of my life. But then, you know, by the time people start going to the studio at like nine or whatever, it's like, okay, I can go to the studio for a couple hours. But. I mean, the other day I called Pump at 9 p.m. And he was, like, clearly just waking up. And I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And he's like, I was in the studio until noon, bro. Yeah, it's, like, like crazy. Do you hate yourself? No, like, I don't get it. They start, your life. they start so late. <laughs> they, they start at midnight, and they go until about 8 in the morning. It's mm. crazy. I don't get it. I mean, I get it in the sense that if you're okay with sleeping until 3 that, p.m. That, yeah, I get it. I, I'm a morning person, so that's. Per, the I need thing. some sunlight. I, yeah, I need to get. I get up. I get up way early. So. Right. I'm I, glad I know that. Yeah, that sunlight is good for you. It is. It is. Even if you don't go outside, just a little bit. will just. I, I. I mean, just being only awake when it's dark. No. Ugh, my brain is just going to be like, what are you, a vampire now? Yeah, no, I, 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 but, but the late night, I mean, I get it, but it's just like, man, I want, then your whole next day's shot. Mm. Unless day's that's shot. the life that you live unless, every single day. Exactly. <laughs> unless that is, yeah, yeah. Which and is unless there's like, crazy. I'm sure there's a lot of things helping, you know, I don't know, but, but yeah, it's a, it's a crazy, it's a crazy world, but that's what we've been doing. You know, I've been kind of like shifting into, I don't know, more like urban and hip hop music. And that's what brought me to like, meeting Kazi and, and Cassius and stuff and and then we hooked up and started making music and, and just kind of like 
I don't know, it's taking on this whole new life, and I'm excited to kind of put out new records and see what people think. You know, Lil, Ma- Lil Mama DM me as well, Did and she? I was super hyped. No way. Just, Dude, to, just to say that she fucks so with what I do, you know? Rad. Yeah. She is, honestly, man, she is like one of the absolute most she's one of the coolest people i know really that i've yeah and spe- i mean in the business like no neck hands down wow, like that's really cool to hear but yeah she's just authentic like no bullshit real like no pretentious anything like, she's just she's just a real girl she's yeah. really cool like the female rapper revolution is kind of upon us that there's this like great hunt by all the labels to try to find every girl who can rap yeah she like i feel like the industry kind of tried to like write her off at a certain point they had a couple memes about her and then they tried to sort of just act like she yeah. wasn't you gonna i don't know exactly what happened but i do feel like if anybody's ready for a second coming of their career Dude, I'm, so, Mama I'm in. so glad that you you say that because I, dude, honestly, since I met her, I've just been like, man, she's something's got to pop for her soon because this is her time. And with, like you said, with all the female rapper stuff, I mean, but she she's so freaking talented. I'm telling you, man, like. It's like that 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 video you see where uh, Rick Rubin's working with Jay Z and he can't, and it's like blowing his mind because he's mm. just freestyling and he's going in and he calls all the guys from Beastie Boys like you gotta come over here and see this this is crazy he's like he doesn't even write any of this shit down he just it's just coming out of him you know that's how Mama was in the in, in the studio I mean she's like I played her the tune she's like okay mm-hmm. starts pulls out her pieces of paper starts writing stuff down she's like all right and I'm like she I'm like you've been here for like 20 minutes and she's already in the booth right. and it's just boom 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 oh no 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 that doesn't work. okay wait that works go back let me let me punch in here and she just started doing this stuff and I was like and it was clever and it wasn't just you know how you know some people come in and they freestyle and you're like okay cool but that's stuff that you've had in your back pocket that's those are you know flows that you've worked on that you have ready but no, I mean, everything that was coming out had to do with the song that, I, like, the lyrics in my song. And they mm. were really thoughtful. And they were, like, a girl answering, you know. The, and it, it was just, it was, like, fucking poetic, you know. Staying was, on topic yeah. is one thing a lot of rappers struggle with. Yeah. I heard Joe, Joe Bunnan bitching about that the other day, that he likes rappers who can actually talk about a topic. And I was like, that is something that yeah, a lot of rappers of do like, not really focus on. Yeah, like, a lot of people, they're like, oh, man, listen to this freestyle, you know. And this guy's just, and you're like, yeah, but... I mean, half of that was already mm. in their in their repertoire. They just kind of pulled it out when they needed it, you know. But when you have a song and you're like, "All right, this is what my song's about," and then someone just comes right in and goes, "Okay," mm, and then they write a poem like right next to it that's like a response or an mm. answer directly to your, you know, your like pop lyrics or whatever. It's just it's crazy. It's it's really really impressive because I can't. I have to sit there and you know rework lyrics and, right. like old school like like. You know, like singer songwriter style. You know, I can't just sit there and just go. Blah, 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 blah. You know what's That's crazy is a lot shit. of that is the Jay Z influence. That like he was the first one that told rappers, "Nah, you can just go in the studio and just spit that shit. You don't have to write it down." And I feel like things have sort of changed because he would listen to the beat so many times that he already kind of knew what he was gonna say. Yeah. Whereas now, like most rappers, or I shouldn't say most rappers, but most rappers who like ascribe to this one uh, sort of identity, like the young thug way of life or whatever, or Gucci man or whatever, they go in there and just sort of start just coming up with shit off the top of their head, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, y- you freestyle a lot of the stuff that we do too. Like, Some stuff. Yeah. I don't, I don't, that I don't understand at all. It's I a just, generational thing and it's yeah. a, it's like a time thing because, you know, a lot of, a lot of like rap studio sessions, there'll be like 10 motherfuckers in there and they're like all sort of competing to get on songs. So if you got to sit there writing a long verse, this is not going to happen. I think I'm just, I think I'm just afraid of looking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm not going to get in there and just start freestyle, just start saying words. Like I got to at least write this shit down and you know work it out first i'm freestyling right now technically i don't know what the fuck i'm about to say next oh that's very true (laughs) that'd be a very boring rap album listen to my spoken word i mean i'm slowly like just going harder and harder the podcast stuff until i convince myself that i can be a rapper but i'm not i'm not there yet podcast is a very good way to start though i mean you know you got the headphones you got the microphone you're talking meet a lot of rappers yeah you're hanging out you got the right crew i'm convinced i could ruin the whole thing by making one rap song though no way you haven't made you haven't made any music no no No, come on i never even played an instrument you don't need to play an instrument yeah but i never rapped either it would go so what well i mean i will freestyle rap zan neither did any of these guys and then they just you know but they started when they were like 15 true (laughs) i was always petrified of being a white rapper you know 
I can't I can't freaking ride a bike, you know. Yeah. I can't. No, you can't ride a bike at all. No, I mean I can ride a bike. I oh, can't. Okay. Just, I, I mean, like from here to the to the store. Right. But I'm not gonna do any cool shit. I'm just. I am in. Well, sometimes I think I'm glad that I didn't want to be a white rapper as a kid because I kind of knew that it would be corny. But then at the other, on the other hand, I'm like, damn, I wish I had that confidence to think I could have been a white rapper. But I only really had Eminem to go on. That's all I, we had. I was like, this guy's incredible. He's a good role model for me as a white person to rap, but I don't that, think I want to actually rap. Eyes. Right, which that that we had that was no, a huge setback. Yeah, and and I grew up in that generation, so that's yeah. all I knew until Eminem came out, and you know, Vanilla took over Ice everything. made it like, oh well, actually no, maybe white people definitely should not rap. No, this, yeah. <laughs> I was really into the Ninja Turtles growing up, though, so I thought Vanilla Ice was really dope because he did like the ninja rap. Do we know what race uh, the Ninja Turtles were? know what race they were yeah i guess turtle huh Tur- uh, yeah i mean they were green so yeah, yeah, like, yeah. that is nice turtle <laughs> i don't know where are turtles from i guess they were japanese right the ocean? They were like no because they i guess yeah i don't know what yeah i don't know if you know, know what race turtles are <laughs> let us know in the <laughs> comments okay so from you guys perspective like how'd you start uh working with drake uh, yeah, we linked up out here. Uh, I'm originally from New Jersey, but uh, I was out here doing some work, working with a bunch of different artists out here, uh, Rich the Kid, Sean mm-hmm. Gast, French Montana, uh, Post Malone, a whole bunch of different people working on Drake stuff, Kazi stuff. Um, yeah, we ran into each other at, uh, the just, at the Maxim, at, at, just that? at like some party, and we just started talking and stuff, and and I'm, I don't know, man, I'm just like trying to, it's like, this is like, it's like a new world, you know, so I'm just trying to link up with people and, and connect and stuff and then i looked up his stuff i was like oh he's like he's the shit he's really talented he makes you know he's worked with a bunch of really great people and makes fire beats and stuff and then kazi's super talented and i just uh well the day i when i found out he started messing with my shit i woke up one morning and he was posted a video on his story and he was playing uh, one of my tracks on oh, the that's radio right. thing i was like what the fuck the oh moment? that's right yeah. i put you on the radio so <laughs> oh that's right I like, yeah i dope. forgot about that but yeah so i found him through because i was wa- i was uh, following little xan mm. and, all, and all the xanarchy crew and stuff and so he was on there did you get interested in him because of ethan no actually i met ethan through oh, him okay. yeah and it's funny too because a really good friend of mine uh plays ethan's girlfriend on shameless okay and so I still hadn't met Ethan through her, but she, it's just, it's a weird, it's, dude, LA is a small world, man. Like, my really good friend is her, is his uh, girlfriend on Shameless. And then I meet, you would think that I would have met Ethan through that, but no, through, through Zan, I met Ethan. And then I met Diablo through Pump. And then, and now Diablo, and now Diablo hangs over with Zan. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's just crazy. So it's just interesting little, little world. But yeah, so I found, uh, Kazi and I was like, oh man, we should uh, work on some music together, or do what, something or whatever. And so he uh, he and we he grew up in like Orange County, so we have like a lot of like same vibes and stuff. So he uh, just drove up and we had we met and stuff, and then just got in the studio and started started just fucking around. And then it ended up into being like a EP, a, a, like a yeah, like an EP that we're gonna drop called The Plan. And then we just finished another song for it last night. Um, but yeah, so it was just kind of oh, let's do this thing and see if it's cool. And then it turned into like, oh, you know, like a whole little EP thing. That's tight. Hey, I just want to say this before I forget, is that a couple of years ago, I interviewed Noah Monk. AKA, oh, yeah, You know, yeah, like yeah. A, a Gibby, Gibby from, from iCarly. From iCarly. So I'm yeah. slowly sort of like completing this whole universe yeah, of like child go. actors and yeah. stuff. Dude, you would you would like rock the world if you got Lil Pump and Miranda Cosgrove in here together. Oh my dope. god! Imagine I just somehow set it up and, uh, and dude, she I'm didn't know it was you, happening. We locked the only, doors. You're only <laughs> what two degrees away. I mean, a text message from me. But a if text you FaceTime her you, right now, do you think she's picking up? No, no. And way. if you message her, I'm about no to way. FaceTime you with Lil Pump, and then <laughs> no, no, you think no. She's, what, what, what is we she face, doing? We can FaceTime Lil Pump though. That's true. Um, we could FaceTime Lil Pump. No, wait, he's, uh, he's, not, he's not with us right now. Oh, yeah, that's right. We can't FaceTime him. He's we at can, large. Yeah, we'll FaceTime Jordan. <laughs> oh, wait, no. What do you say when someone's locked up? Free pump. Free pump. Free pump. That's free what you pump. say. That's a fact. <laughs> yeah, free pump. Uh, um, no, but that would be, that would be pretty amazing. Uh, I, I like that you are low-key like, wanting this to happen. And you're like, you know, I think pump deserves a chance. I honestly, man, here's the thing. And I'm just going to just say this. I didn't. I was big, big brother before I met Pump. I was like, dude, come on, man! Like, 
Leave her alone. Like this, it's enough, enough already, bro. Like right. you're, he, she's not in. You have tattoos on your face. Like it's not gonna happen. She's mm. not. You know. But then I met him, and he's really like he's really nice. He's, he's like perfect a, for her. He's like, I yeah, I would do it. And how? And he's like, he's like, you think she sees it? Like he wasn't like, yeah, I want to smash that. Like yeah, I want to. Like he was very respectful. You know, right. I was like, oh shit. Okay, all right, all right. I'm like, not sure you know about this in, this scenario, but there's a rapper, Kamethazine, who has at least like four times basically said that he wants to like either date or have sex with Demi Lovato. And then she overdosed. And I started to think, like, what if all those lyrical references to her sort of pushed her over the edge? She's like, fuck it. This fucking oh drug God. addict kid is rapping about me. I'm getting back on the sauce. Dude, that's brutal. Is that possible? I don't think so. We don't blame Kamethazine for no, her rapping I don't, her? I don't. I, I, wouldn't go, I wouldn't go that far. Yeah, okay. No. Yeah. Here I am. I'm sort of insensitive. <laughs> on that note, speaking of... Uh, Drake trying to be the next Drake. Nah, dog. I'm... I, I'm don't I'm read just, the comments. I'm just Don't read the comments. Do, do no, you, you gotta vape? read the comments. Oh my god. Do you vape? They're awesome. Do I vape? Yeah. No, I don't vape. Well, but if, if you... I vaped, I would use. <laughs> I would use. Yes. I would use Vuz. Vuz. Be amazed. Shout out Vuz. Today we wanted to remind our audience that this interview is sponsored by Pure Blend Science and their new Vuz Vape. Vuz is your next generation vaping delivery system. If vaping is your thing, you have to check these guys out. The Vuz gets you that ultra clean natural vaping that leaves you with a full flavor and no burnt taste. This vape is not like any other you've seen before. Its unique design actually heats the reusable pods differently than any other vape on the market. I'm not a big science guy, but there's a lot of smart science in this thing. They figure out a way to preheat the concentrate before it's fully vaporized and the clean full flavor results are unmatched. Do you vape THC, CBD, nicotine juice, all of the above? With Vuz all-in-one design, now you don't need the different devices. You can do it all with the Vuz and the Vuz pods. Also, like I mentioned before, these pods are reusable. You can refill them up to seven times each. This pen also has a massive battery that will get you through the day. Do yourself a favor. If you vape or are thinking about vaping, go check these guys out. The Vuz by Pure Blind Science at vozvape.com. I've never actually read an ad like that where I just obviously read the entire thing, <laughs> but it. I felt pretty good about it. Hey, you killed it. Yeah. That's awesome. It always reminds me of that scene in Howard Stern in the Howard Stern Private Parts movie when he re- has to read the commercial, and then he ends up like the commercial's telling him that Oh yeah, I've been to this place and I love this place. And he's just completely lying. And, you know, it's just like <laughs> none of this is true. I'm just reading this from a paper. I'm sorry. This is. I think about BS. that all the time because uh, we've done ads for um, this. Basically, it's like a service that is sort of like a. It's like you can text or FaceTime with with like a therapist, so you can mm-hmm. have conversations with yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, right. I use it all the, the time. I also use it all the time. But I was watching. It's funny when you see people saying like, "I use this." Yeah. Like I use this all the time because it's like in order to endorse <laughs> the problem, they basically have to let you know that they have undiagnosed mental yeah, issues. Yeah, yeah, for sure, right? Which like, is, yeah, a lot of us do. That's yeah. okay because it's true. Yeah, I use this therapist app because I am. I have problems. I'm losing it, man. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't want to. I don't want to trivialize mental health either. No, of course. That's not. a big concern these days. It is. Yeah. How everyone here? Mental health, good. Well, no mental health check. Mm. <laughs> I feel I pretty think, good. I think everyone's kind of. Yeah. I got a workout in this morning, but I also got tested right before, so I had to like lose some blood. What did you get tested for? Because my girlfriend wants to hook up some porn star girls ugh, later in the week, and they don't want to do it unless I have a test. So. Wow, how do I get on that? How do I get into? How do I get that life? What are you talking about? You well, you have a girlfriend and stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I guess she's the one we should consult about this. I just have to get tested. Well, I don't know. We're gonna have to consult her. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll have a talk. I was watching one of your music videos and I noticed that she was all up in the video too, which is a nice touch. No, my girlfriend's not in the video. Oh, she wasn't. No. Fuck. See, I was actually thinking. I'm like, I don't. I can't tell if this is his girlfriend or she just kind of looks like the girl I was lurking yesterday. Who's his girlfriend? Which video were you watching? Probably the most recent one. She directed it, though. Well, there were two. There's two that came out recently, and I think you're probably talking about Honest, because... Yes, uh, I am. She does... I guess she kind of resembles the girl in the video. Well, the, your girlfriend and her both seem to be, you know, tall models. No, they, no, no. Your girlfriend's not tall? Oh, no, you watched Rewind. Okay. So you watched Rewind. No, that's not my girlfriend. She's, a, she's just a friend. Okay. She's a model. What's your relationship status like? My relationship status? Or just like, you know, what's your relationship like? My relationship is pretty dope. How long you been with her? Uh, like five years. Somewhere. Five years. Yeah. Holy shit, that's badass. Yeah, she's dope. She's she kicks ass. We have like we have a management company together, so it's awesome. So like we manage Kazi and stuff, and um, we have some other artists, and uh, she you know we handle all my business and and everything. It's really 
It's really rad. It's That's pretty up. Dope. Yeah. Uh, so Decibel Media Group. Yeah. How old is she? Twenty-four. Okay. You're like, I hope I didn't get that. I, no, I, I got yeah, real scared no, for no, you, no, real quick. No, I think, no, she's I'm 20, like, damn, she, bro. Even I know how old my girlfriend is. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's twenty-four. Um, but uh, but yeah, no. So so it's it's really cool. We have like, it, it just kind of happened. We started managing all of my stuff, you know, because everything just, I don't know, man. People managing your music and your entertainment things just fall through the cracks, and mm. then you're like, what the hell? And then you just you're losing your mind. And we ended up just picking up all the slack and stuff started moving faster and moving quicker and, you know, started getting what I wanted done. And, and I was like, man, why are we paying other people? Why are we giving money away to other people when we're getting all this stuff done? So we decided to just, you know, let go of any management or agents or anything like that and just start doing everything ourselves, releasing our music, you know, my music my, ourselves and um, no labels or anything like that. And then... Going, hey, this would be really cool to uh, do one day for other artists. You know, mm. years down the road, once we learn, you know, once we learn the ropes and all this stuff, and then a few months later, it just artists just started coming. Like, not not even it just serendipitously, if that's a word, it is. Um, just happened, you know, and. Uh, you know, like Kazi, like Kazi, for example, we were like, I just reached out to him because I wanted to work on a song with him and maybe do something. And then he was having issues with his stuff. And then it just kind of, we were like, well, we, we can help out. And that's the other thing, too. It's not like we've cert, you know, we've really <clears throat> searched for anybody or looked looked for anybody. We have a, 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 a little girl who went viral on on like Instagram and she's. She just did some really cool stuff and uh, that we can't talk about yet, but it's going to be so awesome. And then uh, uh, she's going to go do, I mean, there's just a lot of appearances. Like, man, I wish I could tell, talk because those are really cool. But anyway, these people just like started coming into our lives and we're like, well, we could help out. And it just kind of clicked and worked. And now we have singers and rappers and uh, photographers. And, and it's just you they, and her? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and I mean, we have other friends who, who, who work with us and stuff, but, but we basically, I mean, we do, every, I mean, she really does everything, but I just kind of, I'm just kind of the creative here here and there, but she literally handles, like, it blows Come my on. mind. Yeah. But yeah, it's crazy. So so we just kind of started picking up these artists and working on their records and getting them in studios and getting, you know, helping them out and stuff starts started popping and like, you know, it's it's just crazy. So now we have this this company. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's rad. It's really cool. It's fire. Um, what's your average day like? My average day? It depends. It depends on what I'm doing. Uh, my average day is about to be, you know, get up in the morning, drive to a city, check into a hotel, get ready for a show, go play a show, get back, crash, you know, do a meet and greet all night, and then go home, crash, get up the next morning, do it, go to the next city. It's mm. just every day in the next city. And, Honestly, my day mo- mostly my days consist of an airplane, an airport, a car, a, and a hotel room. When, when you're touring, I, I mean, even just all the time. I mean, I don't know how many times I've been. I've been home probably in an entirety like two months out of this year. So wow, far. I didn't know your schedule was that packed. That's I'm crazy. Just, I'm always on the road. Right. I mean, when you say when you're when you're touring, I'm just I'm always touring. There's not like oh, I go on tour in the summer. It's like no, I have a summer tour, and then I come home and then i am home for like three weeks and then i go tour in the fall and then and then we have the spring tour and the, i mean it's just literally like we're just always what's your relationship with that schedule though do you feel like that prohibits you from getting shit done when you're at home or do you feel like you're still in love with that experience no i love that experience and and it, it i don't know i think being at home sometimes it just gets kind of like stifling and you know i think the constant being on the move being on the go make puts you in the mindset of like all right we need to be progressing and things need to be moving and i think when you're at home sometimes three or four days could feel like yeah it's only been three or four days like big deal but when you're on the road you're like dude i've been to five states i've been on four airplanes i've been to six hotels i've done 17 interviews i've played five shows and you can't return an email? <laughs> yeah, for You know real. what I mean? So it's like, oh, I got it on Tuesday, and it's only Thursday. And you're like, yeah, dude. I mean, but come on. So 
I, I like the feeling of being on the road because it puts you in that mindset of like move, move, move. You know. You know what's crazy is like you seem like you're so on point and like your life is so organized and stuff, which is really stands in like stark comparison to like people try to like take these like bad photos of you and then like create this <laughs> narrative that you're like fucked up. Who me? Yeah. Oh, maybe. But it I seems guess. like the total opposite. Get, you know what it is? I think it's just the character on Drake and Josh, I guess. Because it's always so funny. Like, mm. of course. And I think it's just the go-to on Instagram. Like, like memes or whatever. Or memes or whatever. When you're, like, scrolling through, it's like, oh, you know, he must have done all the coke in the world. Like, oh, tell him not to do so much coke. Or tell him not to do so much. Me- or look at this meth head. Or look at this blah, blah, blah. You know, and I have other friends, too, who, like, it really affects, man. It's a real bummer, too, because, like, man, they get, they're really talented, and they're, they're working their asses off, and then they go into their, their, their Instagram uh, comments, and, and, man, they really take to heart what people are saying mm. on Instagram, and then they respond, and then they get, they get, I mean, then they go, and they get isolated, and they, they're at home, and I'm like, Bro, I I don't know. Maybe it's because I grew up without it, so I know what it's like to not have. Well, you've it, had you know, a lot but longer to get used to it. I, too. I think maybe that too. Yeah. Maybe 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 these kids that are being thrust into it that all of a sudden they're like, shit. I woke up and I have three hundred eighty-seven thousand followers, and I had thirteen thousand yesterday, mm. and now people are telling me like all this crazy stuff, and they're taking it to heart. But for me, I don't know. I just like, you know, you go through and you're like. Whatever. Yeah, I'll get a comment that's like, yo, I'm going to kill you. I'm coming to your house tonight. I'm going to kill you. I'm like, all right. My girlfriend, though, I feel terrible for her because she's like way newer to it. So it's like, you know, it's it's such a like learning curve of realizing like this doesn't matter. Like every but, but you know, and then at the same time, I feel like am I less human because everybody can be talking shit about me and it doesn't bother me. And sometimes I feel like I need to do like a mental check of like. Maybe I should care about this. Like, maybe this is a big enough but I deal. Mean, I don't know, man. I just came from a generation of like sticks and stones will break my bones. <laughs> exactly. Man. But like, words won't hurt. And now we're all in the generation of like, words are just as bad as violence. And I'm like, mm. yo, please, please say as much as you want to me before you try and hit me in the face. Like, <laughs> yeah, for just real. Ta- just say everything place. you want to say, but just don't try and hit me in the face because I'm not, I'm a shitty fighter. So like, <laughs> you know, I would way rather you spew vomit. You, you know, roll with security whatever. when you're on the road? No. 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 So you're not I mean, it, it, you're depend- definitely not it depends on where I go. It depends on where I go. Like if I'm out of the country, um, like I have a much bigger fan base in like Latin America, for example. Really? And, yeah. It's 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 crazy. I don't I don't get it. That's I, dope. I wouldn't have guessed. I, I had a big record out there a couple of years ago, and and the songs were really really like number one and all this stuff and all over Mexico and Latin America, and so it was crazy. We went down there, and we were playing. You know, okay, like a thousand. You know, if we if we played like five thousand seats here in the states, it was like oh man, we had a, that was an amazing show. Like oh my god, and so we went to Mexico for the first time thinking, cool, we're going to start um, building this fan base and we'll go to uh, uh, play these little clubs and it'll start to grow and we'll start to you know build this market. And we landed and we got off the airplane and it looked like the Beatles at JFK. I mean, it was like there were fans, just thousands of people and security and all this stuff. And then we, we get whisked away and we're being treated. I mean, it was like... We were Elvis or Justin Bieber. Like, so it was, was like the, you know, going and meeting the president, and 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 going and and having dinner with these dignitaries and these other massively famous people. You know, we go to these dinners, and I'm like, like these people. I mean, th- like the Julia Roberts of, of 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 Mexico, and these these huge stars. You know, and I'm like, they, we're not. They, but down there, they just viewed us as I, I get because the record was so big. I mean, we were. It was just weird. Cause but it was so they so didn't di- have a relationship with the show or any of your prior work. They did work? have a relationship okay. with the show, but it wasn't. It it it, it intensified it. It mm. was like imagine if while I was on Drake and Josh, I had a massively successful album here, you know, and was doing like a Justin Bieber thing or something like that. You that know? must be so crazy. To it be was like, wild. Have your fame level be like adjusted so differently in different countries and yeah, stuff. It's I hope wild. I get to that point. It's wild. So when we got there, I mean, we ended up going to the play. We went in for sound check and dude, we were flying blind. Like 
the agents just said, okay, here's where you get on the airplane. Here's what time you land. Here's where we go. He's picking you up. Here's your hotel, blah, 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 blah. We didn't look up the venues. We didn't look anything up, whatever. So we get to this venue, and it is, I mean, it's the biggest venue in Mexico City. Wow. And Paul McCartney plays here. You know what I'm saying? So I'm looking at, I'm, I'm looking at the, I'm like, all right. So there must be, like, you know, some smaller club inside this place and then we set up for sound check and all of our stuff set up and we walk in there and it's a 10,000 seat arena and I'm like there's what the fuck what is going on like this has got this has got to be a joke like what you know and then uh, anyway we sold out two two a matinee show and then a an evening show so we did two shows to 10,000 to, to like 20,000 people that day and then we went and you know toured that around all over Latin America and Brazil and all that stuff. Uh, but it was it was it, it was just it blew our minds. I mean, we literally came from like playing the Roxy, and then we're like, all right, we're gonna go play some clubs in Mexico, and then and walked out no on idea. stage, and there was ten thousand people that knew every single lyric to every song on the record. It was unbelievable. That's so crazy too, because you can never really fully understand like what it was within their culture that made that song work so perfectly at that moment. You know, yeah. it's sort of like just mysterious. Like you're inside of this bubble where it's like, you know, I don't really understand what kind of music Mexican yeah. people like or like yeah, how no, they I figure a, out their favorite songs. I had a friend who had a huge hit and it became sort of almost an, like an anthem for uh for South Africa and right. yeah and but it didn't really i mean it charted okay you know in the states you know like the 80s 90s you know but it was like number 1 in this one region and it became sort of an anthem and mm. it, it, it's sort of like the uh what's what was that movie about that songwriter um uh, the one who you know it was like homeless, and then right. All Rodriguez is it? Ro- Rodriguez. Oh, I forget his name, but it's this whole it's movie. Something like Rodriguez. Something like that. Rodrigo. Um, some shit like yeah, that. Where he, like that. he he had a hugely famous song, and he didn't even he didn't know. know. He didn't then, know. Yeah. yeah. And then years later, like, didn't you know that you were basically the Beatles in this in this area of the world? I did and, watch that documentary. And then he went back and did the same thing. He went back and was like, I was a homeless guy living in a you know basically squatting, and then he goes back to this country and they sell out. And he's like, oh, my God. And he's like, they, everyone knows the songs and everyone. It, yeah, so it's That's just kind of crazy. Yeah, it's like that, that, you know, oh, I'm big in Japan, you know. It's, <laughs> it's true. It's like, it's true. You go, it's wild. I know. People totally think that's a lie when, like, people say that. Like, it's become, like, a meme yeah. or, like, a cliche. But it's crazy to think that actually happens. Yeah, no, it's like here, you know, you're, you're, you're spelling your name to the girl at Starbucks. And then <laughs> you fly across the, the world and you're, like, being whisked away by Secret Service. It's, it's crazy. Damn. Yeah, it's wild. That is crazy. But that's what's fun about just touring the world, you know. It's like there's so much outside the United States. It's like, you know to get at and the, and the latin fans i mean there's nothing i mean playing a show here in america is great it's fun and the fans are awesome but man once you get outside they're so loyal and like i mean you could i mean lack of better words be like you could fart on a record and they'd be like yes i love yeah. it number one you know uh, america but, doesn't really feel like traveling to me so much because yeah. it's like you know when you're in america it's like there's a, you know how the hotels work. You know mm-hmm. that you could grab your phone and type hotel, and boom, your Uber is going to take you to a yeah. hotel. It's just not that complicated. There's a lot less things that can go wrong, especially if you like stay out of bad areas. So it would be like an easy thing to Yeah, maybe... I mean, that's the same thing with traveling, though, too. It's like, you know, there's good places, bad places. Oh I, oh, I heard it's so dangerous there. It's like, well, yeah, but so is L.A. Like, mm. don't go in those areas of L.A. at certain times of the night, you know? Yeah. If you're a famous musician, just don't go anywhere besides the hotel and yeah. maybe, like, the club if you're, like, escorted by somebody there. I yeah, know. but I feel like, I don't know, I feel like sometimes there's a... there's A, <sighs> a degree to which you want to be normal? Yeah, a degree of which you want to be normal, but also a degree of which... You want to be seen with a big group of security guards and mm. entourage and escorts because, you know, I mean... Feels good. Honestly, there's there's a level of, obviously, like a Justin Bieber where there's just... You have no option. Like, you're mm. going to go out. You're going to go out. You should most likely have somebody trailing you 10 feet at all times. Mm. Like, that's just... You're a John Lennon. Like, you're way too big. Uh, you know, turn over a rock and that person who's been living under there for 10 years knows who you are, you know? Mm. But... For the most part, 
a lot of these people are only really, really recognized by their fans mm. or by people who know, like, oh, okay, who they are. And so when they're in there, especially out, outside the country, when they're just, like, in their normal world, normal lives, like, you know, I mean, I even, in, even like, if I'm in Mexico, I... Dude, I'll leave my hotel and I'll walk down the street and I'll, yeah, eventually there'll be like a big group of people following and, you know, wanting to sit down. But we usually just end up sitting down and like having tacos together or something. <laughs> and like it ends up being like a big last supper, like big long table of just fans. And we hang out and it, as long as you just are cool with people and aren't, you know, obviously you have to be careful and you have to, mm. you know, have street smarts and be, pick your, pick your, you know, times and see that judge people you know the scenario of of like being able to just hang out with them seems dope but when i try to do that a lot of times it just becomes a photo session and then i just don't get that much enjoyment out of it yeah it does but i think that also you know when you are accessible and approachable it becomes less of like Oh, this is my only chance to get a picture with you mm. right now. Like, like you're only gonna spend what f- two minutes with me, so like I gotta get a picture with you right now. And if it's more of like, yeah, oh, what you want a selfie? Yeah, sure. Oh, here, give me your phone. Come here. And then it's more of like, oh, wow, I could, I could wait till the end of the dinner and, and approach him nicely, or I could, you know, he's not gonna bite me. You know, I don't have to jump in there. It's like a lot of times when the swarming does happen, like. It's because they think, oh my God, mm. he's gonna. He, I'm not gonna get. I'm not gonna get this moment with him. Or I'm not gonna get the picture. And then I just turn around to everyone. And I'm like, dude, I got no. Unless you know, I usually don't have somewhere I have to be at that moment. You know. And so you're just like, dude, everyone will get their pictures or whatever you want to do. You know. And then everyone just kind of like chills and is cool. And I don't know. I just like being more approach, approachable and engaging with with like fans and stuff. Definitely. Yeah. It's cool. Uh, what so like what are you? How, does that hurt when you tattoo your face? Um, yeah, I mean no, not really. Because mm. I have a lot of tattoos and 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 they hurt. <laughs> but like the, I don't know about is, getting it on my face. From my perspective, usually when you get face tattoo, it's a pretty small line, a small needle. So it's like a very like fine line, and they're sort of like having to be more gentle because it's a smaller space so then it doesn't really hurt that bad but from my perspective like the back of my head is the worst thing i've ever gone through sounds terrible i was fucked up and it was still the worst i have a lot of tattoos but like they they are i mean i'm not one of those guys like oh no man they don't no but like those they hurt but these are like big big ass needles and it's on and they're like old school like traditional so like they're really i miss getting tattooed like like there because then those are the area where you have the most muscle and like you know fat and everything whereas like the back of your skull there's nothing to protect your freaking skull and And you guys got your hands that's Uh, just around the the knuckles hurts pretty bad hands I mean, it was pretty fast. Even what though it was the, a big what about, didn't hurt. What about the healing, like, on your... Did, was no big deal? I mean, yeah, it always sucks. I'm worried about getting my back done. Because this dude told me he wants to do two guys on my back pause for eight hours. And just be able to get as much of the back done as possible That'd in one sick. go. I'm really scared of what that's going to feel like healing up. Because you know I'm going to have some fucking monster scabs oh, of just yeah. ink and just... Oh, yeah. But, you know, whatever. I might schedule, like, a, an easy week after that so I don't have Dude, to do, I'm like... Dude, jonesing for tattoos now. Yeah? Yeah. That's tight. I need to go get inked. You know, the one I thing... Have I... A session, I have a session, but not until, like, November or something. Yeah. We got to go to Marco, too. Yeah. Oh, Shout yeah, out yeah, Vanilla Gorilla sure. Tattoos. I know a bunch of guys who are... Uh, there's this guy, Romeo Lacoste. Uh, I know it? Romeo. Romeo, yeah. he yeah, wants yeah. to... He's been hitting me up about tattooing, like, Xan and Pump and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Romeo. He's done, he's done a lot. He does more, like, you know, like... Traditional type stuff and, and everything, stuff yeah. And like, oh no, he ha- he does like the, the cute, like tiny little yeah, face tattoo like designs Ariana's and stuff. Yeah, and so like little like princess. R.I.P. Like Mac like, Miller. But, yeah, for real. But I got a I got a session with. Have you heard of Dan Smith? Mm. He's bad. He's, he's a badass. He's like my favorite traditional. All my stuff is like super traditional. Do you so see like, yourself you being like it. fully head to toe tattooed? Honestly, I don't even know. I. I I'm always say that I'm not going to go on like my forearms just because I don't know. I like to. I don't even know why. And just it's. I don't know so why. You got the feather. Do. But like, Are yeah. you been getting that laser? And then the war is over thing. I got two laser jobs done, and then because when I first got it, it was like a uh, 
like a f- like stamp, like black. It like was it fully fake. black. That's like pretty good for fake, two uh, you know? two sessions on it. Yeah, like it looked fake. And so I went and got set two sessions done, and then I was like, wait a minute, that's actually kind of cool. It looks now, more like a rubber stamp yeah, type I, vibe. Yeah, yeah, I dig it. And now I go to every tattoo artist. It's like, how did they do that? Like how. What? Like, oh, just, remo- just removal treatments on it. That's but yeah, crazy. so now I, now I now I like the way it looks. But that does look cool. Um, but yeah, I don't know about going all the way. Like, I mean, I've I've started to do a bunch more on my back, and I don't, I don't know. I got one tattoo on. I mean, I had a bunch of tat, like a couple of tattoos, but they were random. And then I got this one on my arm, and my buddy looked at me, and he's like, and I had nothing on my arms. I mean, other than this one, and this one, um, and he's like. Oh, it's over. I'm like, what do you, he's like, I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, you're, you're, he's like, by the end of the year, you'll be sleeved. He's like, by the year, he's like, you're done. It's over. You're done. I'm like, no, I'm like, what? It's one tattoo. I'm like, it's one tattoo on my arm. I'm not going, it's, it's going to look cool when I play guitar, like big deal. You know? <laughs> and then literally six months later, I'm sitting in a, you know, tattoo chairs and I'm like, I got this, I, like I, this one, this one, this one all in one sitting. I got this one and. And uh, this one and, and this one all in one sitting. And it's just like, I got, I was like, okay, you're right. Yeah. Shit. God. It's addicting. Once dude. you get into it, God. I'm surprised I haven't. I got the, the one on my face a couple of months ago and this at the same time. And then I haven't done anything since. Damn. But I'm, I'm, I want to do that back session. So but I like the idea of doing that eight hours with two artists going at the same time. Extreme efficiency. Insane. Dude, a lot of Vicodin. You read my mind, bud. <laughs> You're playing into the meme right there. They're gonna be like, "Oh, of course he told him to take Vicodin." Dude, it hurts. I don't give a fuck. I don't care. No facts, but with the combination of anti-anxiety medication, pain pills, and the, the numbing cream, that numbing cream is key. I don't know how the hell I was getting tattoos before that shit, uh, dude. I don't get. Oh, have you had the new uh, the new? Um, Stuff that they the plastic shit that they have to heal it. Yes, that's just it's, cool too. And they huh? just leave it on for like f- like f- whatever a few days or whatever. And then when you pull it off, there's no scabbing, nothing. It's just done. Your tattoo's like healed. Really? See, I didn't realize it was that good. Oh, dude, you got to leave it on. A lot of people just peel it off. They're like whatever. But it's this new thing, man. Seriously, I leave it on for like a day longer than they tell you. And by the time I peel it off, it's like you just wipe it and it's fucking done. Like wow, no, really heal, no know. scabbing, no, and the colors. So it's, it's crazy. It's amazing. it's amazing. But yeah, that, that, ta- oh man, the numbing stuff. Like, yeah, I'm a pussy and I'm not scared to admit it. Like I'm not getting I'm tattooed because I like dude. the like, pain. No, I do not like the no, pain. No, I hate it. I, I can't tell you how many tattoos I've been like, how, this is going to suck to have half a tattoo on my body, but. I'm, I have to tap out. It's going to suck. Yeah. I'm going to have half a tattoo, but there's no way right. I'm going to be able to go another hour on this. There's just no way. And then you just somehow, you just mentally, like, Oof. you just get there. And you, you see, just now you're it. reminding me why I hate it so much. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it funny that, like, someone who's got is this many tattoos and we're just bitching about how bad mm. they hurt? Yeah, because I've always will have somebody come up to me in public and be like, yo, man, like, Tats don't hurt. Like tats feel good. I like the way the needle feels in my skin. And I'm like, well, you're a fucking idiot because no, you're, you're a, bleeding. No, you're your body liar. is telling you that it doesn't feel good yeah. when the blood exits your body. Yeah, Stop a, lying. You're a liar. Liar. You're Lies. way too into the process. It's not about the yeah. process. It's about the end result. It's like it's unlike everything else in life. Dude, my friend was getting a tattoo one time, and oh my god. Sorry, I'm telling a story, but we, we, he he was underage, right? And oh boy. We were in New Orleans. And he, uh, we didn't even have a fake ID. Like, I don't even know what, I was just like, yeah, he's 18. It's cool. Like, and these guys were just, they didn't care or something, whatever. But so he was a big, uh, Chris Farley fan. And we were like, what are we going to get tattooed? What are we going to get tattooed? We're at the hotel, like trying to think of all these like references and le- you know, and I've, I've got like lyrics. So he's like, maybe I should say like one of his lines or something. You know? So we were, one of his favorite sketches was, uh. The van down by the river sketch. Oh, I love that shit. You know, oh my God. Living in a van down by the river. I miss Chris Farley sincerely. I dude. wish I knew what he was like as an old man. Oh, man. Dude, I, I got to work with his brothers a lot. And it, it's like, it's so crazy how similar they are. They You can really tell. It, that that was brothers. like, that was like, my era of same, SNL. Same. You know, like, like yeah. when you're a certain age, you think SNL is so fucking funny. And you think all the characters are the best characters that will ever exist. Dude. He was on that, my, my yeah, roster. Yeah, that era with, the, with Adam Sandler and David Spade. Adam and Sandler, too, yeah. is... 
as a kid, yeah. I invested way too much time into his comedy albums Dude, and I, the first few movies. I risked getting in trouble so much because we would be sitting in my room listening to, you know, play with your balls for mama. Play with your balls for mama. I was about to start like, saying it too. <laughs> play with your cock and balls for mama. Come and get the sandwich. Yeah, like, <laughs> your and balls. Jimmy, you stay here, you yeah. play with your cock and balls. <laughs> like, I just couldn't believe it. And I, dude, the goat, thinking back. The goat in the back, back of the yeah, truck. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking back to uh, he went to the Ragu Festival. How young I was listening to those records, I can't even believe it. Like, like my mom should have took those away. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. My my I can't, I think about my kids listening to something like that, and I'm just like, I don't mean I don't have kids, but eventually I'm like, dude, there's no way I would never, yeah. ever even. That's just that's just nuts. My mom threw away my Tupac CDs, but left the Adam Sandler CDs. Now that's messed up. Oh my god, they're both they dangerous. Don't, yeah, but they don't. They, yeah, they don't know. They don't know. Oh, they leave the comedy albums for them. Yeah. Let them. It's fine. Well, but she never would have guessed rap. from that no, cover no. that yeah, this right? is just as yeah. fucked up. A goat. Yeah. 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 Uh, but anyway, so he gets he get he's getting a tattoo. He's underage, and he's sitting in his he's sitting in the, in the, in the chair, and the guy's tattooing now. Mind you, he's riding van down by the river <laughs> on his back, and I'm talking big, like this. Oh right? god! All right. I kind of like that. I might steal that. Yeah, and he's I mean he's a comedian, so it works. It get it, it's 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 a cool tattoo. So he's sitting there, and he's and he's t- he's tattooing, and my buddy. You know, shirt off, and he's sitting there, and he just uh, he just goes, <laughs> and just seen that. passes out. And my buddy, and and the tattoo artist goes, "Oh, we're losing him! Oh, we're losing! Him. And we've lost him! And he's gone!" And I was like, "Holy crap! What? He's fucking underage! Like, what am I gonna do? Like, oh my god, we're busted! We are busted! Like." We don't have an ID for him. He passed out. They're going to call somebody. Cops are going to come. I am I think I was 18 at the time, so I'm like, I'm going to be in trouble because I brought this kid here. You know, I'm like, whoa, what's going to happen? And then finally, my, you know, he's, the guy's holding my buddy. My buddy's pretty big, and he's holding him, and finally he, he comes to, and he's like, what? Oh, I'm okay. And he sits, he stands up, and my, the tattoo artist is like, nope, you're sitting down. And he gives him some... Uh, some orange juice and like get some get some back gets his senses back you know and the tattoo artist is like all right well we're done like we're not we can't finish the session i'm not finishing the session you know this is he he can't handle it he's gonna have to you know and i'm like gonna have to what live with iver on his back (laughs) i'm like it literally just said iver i-v-e-r and he's like i'm not finishing Uh, he can't handle it i'm like dude it says Iver on his back. Like, you can't. Like, and so it went from me being freaked out to me begging. Like, you can't let my friend leave with Iver on his back, bro. Like, <laughs> please, you know, you got to help me out here. And so finally my buddy ate, like, a bunch of candies and shit, whatever, got, like, his sugar level back up. But And he was, like, holding his breath, too. He's like, I think I was just holding my breath. Like, it just hurts so bad, you know? He's like, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm like, you get up there and you get this tattoo finished because I'm not, I'm not going to let your mother blame me for why you have Iver on your back, dude. <laughs> so uh, he ended up letting him finish the tattoo and now he has the, the Band full down the river, Which but, is much oh better. My, yeah, much better than Iver. But oh my God, I was so scared. I was like, dude, I'm busted. I'm gonna, something's going to happen to me. I don't know. And, and my friend has Iver on his back for the rest of his life. And, and who's going to finish that tattoo for him? Like, I'm just like, oh, my God. He That's has amazing. it at least until he's 18. I mean, he's got it at least till nobody can fix it till he at least turns 18. So. I feel like that getting tattooed under the age of 18 law is, like, slowly becoming passe because there's so many, like, famous young rap kids that have tattoos that Dude, are, like, 16. It blows my mind how many people I've met. And they have, like, they'll, come, they'll be at my concert in, like, a meet and greet. And they'll have tattoos. And not just, like, one. Like a couple tattoos, and I'll be like, "Oh, those are dope," you know. <laughs> um, and they look kind of young. And I'm like, "Oh, how old are you?" And they're like, "Oh, 16, 17, 14. I'm like, I'm "Like, yeah, I got it with my mom." I'm like, "Right, what? the mom like, can sign a note, I think." Yeah, the mom yeah. can sign, and a lot of like mothers and daughters are like going and getting like, "Oh, yeah, I got it with my mom." And so, <laughs> I'm like, "Dude, you're 14." Like, I would delight. In I was telling 17 my kid. When I, or 16 when I got 16 or 17 when I got my first one. I used a fake ID. If I could have got tattoos when I was 12, I would have a bunch of Rage Against the Machine tattoos. 
Yeah. I, That's why my kid's not going to tattoo until he's older. Or I, unless it's cool. I have... I, I, I do have an... I mean... I have Stray Cats tattoo, which because of this is just a tattoo I've always wanted. My Brian Setzer, my favorite guitar player, has the tattoo. It is the Stray Cats logo, but he has the fucking tattoo, so I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And then I do have War Is Over from the Beatles, but I do have like so I am guilty of it a little bit. But yeah, people who you know put like the Beatles walking across Abbey Road or like mm. something so distinct of a band, like if it's some cool. Vague, like if you had some reference of Rage Against the Machine on your body or like some lyric or some cool thing. Something like that, subtle. Yeah, that'd be cool. I know I wanted the Rage Against the Machine logo. But like, but if it was, yeah, yeah. but if it was like Battle for Los Angeles, <laughs> like album cover, you know, on your arm, it's kind of yeah. like, oh, well, I don't know if you're going to like that one. But no, I have a lot of friends who literally they just like have their bands, like favorite bands just like on the, I'm like, that's kind of. Like a old jacket. Yeah, like make something from the. I don't know, take a lyric from them and make your own design of something from that yeah. band. As I get older, I'm more and more like tattoos should look like tattoos. Yeah, exactly. I like your tattoos. That's why I like traditional, like, tattoos, like so. that's what they should, yeah, it should be like five colors, you know, big needle and all this. I just, if anything, I wish I figured that out earlier in my life. Well, then you see what happens when people don't follow that. It's like, remember in the 90s oh, when yeah. people were doing the no uh, no lines mm. and they it were just looking. just ages so bad. Yeah, and they looked really cool and they... You know, they all blended together with all these watercolor looking things. And then 10 years later, it literally looks like just a blob of yeah. color. Half the time like, I'm getting no tattooed, lines, I'm, I'm no. looking at the tattoo artist's tattoos, just thinking like, how the fuck did you end up with that thing on you? Because yeah. that looks terrible. Yeah. I bet you wish you didn't have But that's actually funny to me, because if you think of a tattoo artist would be on it, getting that shit lasered off or covered up or whatever. But a lot of times they're so busy doing their own thing, they just don't even give a shit. That's what, that's what makes me wonder about some of these rappers' tattoos, because I'm like, yo, you got a lot of money now. Mm. So you could totally just be like, okay, I'm going to go on Instagram and I'm going to find the best artist there is. And then I'm going to hit him up and I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to be in your town on November 14th. Come to my hotel room. And they will, ta they will come there and they'll tattoo you. And then you'll have like a badass tattoo. But these guys get like... They just want like a word or something, you know? But it's not even good though. Like yeah. they get... They, like these guys just get tatted on their face, like all this stuff. And I'm like... I don't know. It reminds me of like just like being walking down Hollywood Boulevard and just popping in a, in a tattoo parlor and being like, "All right, let's do it." Like, wouldn't I mean you have a lot of money? Like, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you go and get like some bad like? But I don't think that they're like, necessarily the, aware the of what that now. is. Like, you're at the Gucci level now, so go get like a tattoo at that level. But I don't think that they think. I don't think they know enough about tattoos to really get that. And I think it's so impulsive and possibly drug induced most of the time when the, most yeah. of these rappers get shit that they're just like, no, this word, like, I just made this song. It's called this. Boom. I want it now. Boom. And like, but you know what? I think I think there's gonna be like a mass. Like, all these rappers who are getting crazy face tattoos that are going to want to be lawyers down the road. Dr. Tadoff is going to come yeah. out of uh, I think you're going to see a huge degree to which people are yeah. getting tattoos removed and to a level. And even me, I sometimes think about it. It's like, shit, like, if it's that easy when I'm 45, like, am I going to want to fucking get some shit removed that I'm not into anymore? I mean... I've always wondered that, like, if th that far down the road, are we going to get to the point where getting tattoos removed is so, like, so easy? You know? Right. I've, what if it wasn't ten sessions? What if it was? Yeah. You know, because even that one that you got laser, you could get that covered up super good oh, right totally, now. Yeah. You know, and that was two sessions. It's yeah. like what, like a thousand bucks, probably. Yeah. yeah, dude, I had one on my back of my arm. It was a total anchor. It was only the outline, no color or anything, but it was a full anchor. It had a flag here. Said there, Grandpa. Yeah, all right here. How many times you get lasered? Uh, I don't see anything. Like six or seven sessions, um, and then before I got tattoos here, it literally looked like I never had a tattoo in my life. Wow. It's it, the tattoo removal session. Are they it was as painful? The laser treatments as the tattoos? Yeah, it sucks. It's yeah, but they're not as long. So it's like where a tattoo, you're going to sit yeah. down for two hours, your removal treatment's going to take 10 minutes. That's five, five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> yeah. So it and hurts. Skin. It sucks. But and it, it, did you have like huge black space? So it bubbled up like crazy because yeah, yeah. this and people don't know this entire arm is a cover up, but it was from oh, these like sort of like such a sick tattoo. Thank you. I love this arm. Shout out to uh, Eli Quinters. 
out there in Brooklyn. But like it was just an outline. So when I got it lasered, I had to get it lasered maybe four or five times, but it didn't really hurt that bad. Yeah. But I've seen pictures of people who have big like if I were to get this lasered. Ooh, I've had friends who like literally it gets boil like big boils. Yeah, like, that I've didn't seen happen like, to sticking me. Sticking off but, like that, yeah, it's crazy. I think Pharrell had some removed, right? I think you yeah, he had he tons had removed, removed, like completely. His also, uh, arms, Jeffrey Star had tons removed, really? and then and then had like uh, I think Nikki Hurtado do uh, like the most unreal freaking Catwoman, Michelle Pfeiffer Catwoman on his arm. Wow, that looks like. The- I mean, it looks better than a photograph. Like it's unreal. But he did a ton of. Uh, yeah, check that out. Of, uh, you friends with Jeffrey Star? Removal. No, I just like his tattoos. <laughs> I just like I watched the Shane Dawson like, a lot of Gucci. thing about him. Oh yeah, are you like uh, the biggest Gucci fan in the world? You're like definitely wearing love... at least ten thousand dollars worth of Gucci <laughs> right now. His Gucci closet's insane. I love Gucci. Really? Yeah. yeah well, okay, you got to watch this because the video that they have of his Gucci collection is like obscene. No way. It's like rooms and rooms with so many purses and jackets and shit. It's like unthinkable that someone could have this much. And it, a lot of it is like the super rare shit, I think. Yeah, like he's not yeah. just going in the store. I don't know. Yeah. No, that's what I love about Gucci is like, you know, I don't know, the rare stuff. I, I, I love, I like, I love, I'm a huge fan of Alessandro. So I just like, ever since he took over Gucci, it's been like, uh, just a complete rebirth, you know? Like when Tom, like the Tom Ford era and all that stuff, like I was, I was more in, I mean, I liked Dolce & Gabbana when Tom Ford was at Gucci because they were doing more rock star looking stuff. It was more like, you know, sailor jackets and Sergeant Pepper looking coats and more like British rock stars would, would shop at like Dolce & Gabbana in the era that like Tom Ford was more like sleek and, you know, red carpet. And, um, I mean, look at Tom Ford now. I mean, it's like, you know, James Bond, you know. Do you think and that now Alessandro has taken Gucci and from James Bond and turned it into Elton John rock star? Like, do you think Virgil's gonna make Louis the new Gucci? I don't know. I was wondering about that. I mean, Louis. Uh, the, here's the thing that's interesting right now that's happening. Like, even Burberry is in in is in between um, uh, designers and. So there's like a lot of borrowing going on, but it's interesting if you notice all of the borrowing is being borrowed from Gucci. Mm -hmm. Like even if you look at like Louis' uh, handbags, I mean uh, 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 suitcase line, suitcases and stuff, it's like they're doing the Gucci Courier with all the patches Mm -hmm. and all of this. And then if you go to if you go to Burberry and they're doing the half this crazy pattern and half this crazy pattern, which is exactly what Prada started this season and like. like is Louis going to become more like Off White and then somehow be better than Gucci? I don't know if that is actually going to play out. Well, I don't know. I mean, Alessandro is like, I don't know. I have Alessandro no is like the expect. John Lennon of 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 of. of uh, <laughs> You've referenced John Lennon three different times so far. I know. So I think I think I just usually <laughs> say, instead of using the word genius, I just replace right. it with John Lennon. You know. I say the same thing about, about Lil Pump. Yeah, exactly. Anytime I yeah. want to describe anything that involves any kind of intelligence, I'm like, well, it was like Lil Pump was saying one it's time. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I always say that before I start Gucci Gang when I'm playing live. I'm like, this is one of my new, my, my favorite new American songwriters. You know, they just really. Lilium Pumpernickel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <I> love- <laughs> Well, he's just like, yeah, this guy's just really just moving me. This, you know, his, his lyrics. He's he's like the Bob Dylan of today. Mm. And then I, I start, and then I start into Gucci Gang. Facts. But uh, I wish it was here right now, so you guys could sort of like play us out together and yeah. pull out the acoustic guitar. Dude, we gotta do, we gotta do. Yeah, I got that. Would be so sick that if would we be could get in the room with Pump. He's always on. The, he's always on the road. Yeah, he's, he's always. He's everywhere. tough to get close to. He's very, very. Uh, it's tough to get close to anybody because we're always on the freaking road. It's like. And always in some other state or city or anything like Tank. Like I was uh, working, like I told you, I was working with Tank God too. Oh yeah, yeah. On this record, and um, I was wanting to get him in here with us too, but he's like, I, you know, he's in New York and he's over here and he's. Over, it's like literally, we're just like. I like him because in other places, he, he so. legitimately introduces himself to people as "What's up? I'm Tank. I produce Rockstar for Post Malone." Yeah, yeah, isn't he? But a- every single person's like, "Oh, that's dope," and then you yeah. just don't forget. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, hey, man. A lot of people doing that, I would think it was kind of corny, but when you do it, somehow it seems dope. So. Because he's like, because he's brand new, and mm. it's in the and you see the innocence behind it. it too. Like he's not, it's there's no, he's not pretentious about it. Mm. He's just like, 
like when he came in the studio, I was expecting like, I don't know, hey, I produce Rockstar, like I know my shit. And he just came in and was so nice and friendly and ready to collaborate. And, you know, I didn't feel like, you know, he, like I couldn't collaborate with him and be like, oh, I don't know about that. And, you know, he, mm. he was just open to everything. And, um, yeah, it was just cool. It, dude, having that right out the gate, like shit. Like, yeah. That's the thing, too, is he's like, man, I didn't even know. Like, the record came out in September, and in August, I was just at my house with my parents, and they were like, is that record ever going to come out that you worked on? Like, and he's like, I don't know. I, I, I hope so. It's been, it's been like a year, and he was just so – he's like complaining about it. He's like, man, it just takes so long for records to come out. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of how it works, dude. Like, <laughs> you know, you can't just – it's not just SoundCloud. You can't just go make an, al- an album, you know, a song, and then put it up on SoundCloud. I mean, you can. But, but normal musicians are used to that process. Star, right, yeah. Rap kids are used to hearing a version of the song that sounds pretty damn close to the final version by the end of the night. You exactly. Know? Yeah. That's n- – like, that's, that, that's something that in, getting into these sessions is new to me, too. I mean, I'm used to – all right, we write the song. Okay, we go in, we record drums. Okay, now the next day we're going to record all the instruments. Okay, next day we're going to do vocals. You know, spend a day doing vocals. And then then we're going to mix a song. And then we have to... Ma- I mean, I go in and I do these songs. And, yeah, by the end of the night, I'm leaving the studio with nearly a finished track other than, like, mastering. I'm like, holy shit, this is really rad. Like, I start pumping out music like crazy you know when i read about like how the songwriting process takes place for like a lot of pop artists and stuff too it makes me realize that the way that rappers kind of make songs is pretty similar to that process because it's really just about like the songwriter like going in and just sort of like freestyling like a rhythm or a little bit of a vibe on the track yeah and then they figure out what works and they go from there and that's most of the time when i see a rapper freestyling in the booth it's like that's what they do is they're just sort of you know trying to figure out the pattern or whatever and they sort of go from there, which is... It's the same thing. Know. I mean, I was listening to... And I thought, I mean, you, before you really learn or start collaborating with people, you just think the stuff that you're doing, you're like, oh, that's what I do. That's not Nobody else does that. But when you write a song, you're literally sitting there going, I was waiting for the fun time. I was waiting for the fun time. You were sudden on the fun time. Oh, shit. Okay, that sounded like first time. First time sounds cool. I was waiting on the first time. First time. Oh, first time. Okay, you know. And then you just start singing gibberish. Mm. And then, like, you're like, oh, wait. That that word sounds like it fits there. Now, can we elaborate on that? And that's what I would always do. And then I was hearing a, an interview with Steven Tyler from Aerosmith. Was it Joe Rogan? And no, it was Howard Stern. Okay, he and, did that. He did Joe Rogan recently. Oh, did he? Oh, it's got to be a dope one. Um, the Elon Musk one was so sick. Oh god, yeah, that fake um, ass weed hit. I'm yeah, like, right. Oh. How about that? It's like the like the uh, what's it like the like uh, Nicki Minaj. Hit you know, a lot of people come on this podcast and fake smoke weed. Really? But well, occasionally. But most of them didn't invent the electric car either. Yeah, yeah. It's like a, you invented this fucking car. What do you have to prove? You don't yeah. have to hit the wood. Anyway. Um, but. Uh, uh, shit, what was I saying? We were talking about... Uh, Steven Tyler. Oh, yeah, so Steven Tyler... You, wow, you're good at this. Not really. I just uh, have a terrible <laughs> memory. <laughs> uh, so Steven Tyler, anyway, they asked him, you know, what's your process for writing a song? And he literally sat there and he went, I just go, I was then sitting on the phone and then the 45 sitting there. Okay, cool. And then he just then he <laughs> plays it back and he's like, oh, that sounded like a word. Oh, that sounded like a word. And then he just tries to... I'm like, holy shit, that's like... You know, and I was a kid hearing this and I was like, holy crap, like dope that's i'm i must be doing something right like right. i must be nobody taught me how to like oh this is how you write a song or this is how, same with like these rappers like nobody sat there and taught them like this is how you do it it's just like you kind of just do it or you don't but um but yeah it was interesting to kind of see that somebody else is who's massive and that i really look up to is just did the same same thing i thought because you think like no you're you're like bob dylan you're steven tyler you must sit down and and write this amazing right. your lyrics must come so naturally and i mean you're just you're just so incredible and then you hear s- stories about like paul mccartney like no yesterday was scrambled eggs baby i love your legs it wasn't until i really sat down and started flushing it out that it became yesterday all my troubles seem so far away you know he's like yeah i have shitty lyrics too you're like oh, okay that's awesome <laughs> Wow, well, that I'm not really the only one. No, that's great. Yeah, because I, I feel like there's a certain... When you're not trying to be creative, it's much easier to land on something good. Like I feel like a lot of my funniest ideas are because I either 
think that I overhear somebody saying something that they weren't actually saying. Yeah. But then I have that idea logged in my head and I'm like, damn, like, and I start to like sort of piece together like a joke or like a tweet from that. Yeah. But it's that moment of like, not really, when you're not really paying attention that actually works. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like brings me back to even when I was writing the Drake and Josh theme song. It's like when we were trying to write a theme song, we were getting nowhere. We were getting nothing, you know? And then when I was finally like, dude, fuck it, let's just write a song. Let's just, you know, and then it just started to happen because we weren't trying. We were just mm. like, yeah, just have fun. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wait, this melody and this chord progression and this, let's put the, let's make the lyrics to this because this might sound like a theme song. And then it just ended up happening, you know? I think that is true. It's like, you know, when you're trying and trying and trying for something, it's like, you know. So kids, uh, lesson learned, don't try. Yeah, don't try at anything. Don't just work give very up. hard. Yeah. There's just, no free will. Yeah, it'll just happen for you. <laughs> what do you want to tell them to uh, look out for before we uh, wrap uh, this up and go hit this Vu's vape pen? Yeah, dude, just new uh, new music. Just go check out. Uh, we got new records coming out. Kazi's new records yeah. coming out. No, uh, Escape. no Escape, and then uh, our and, collaborative project. Yeah, we got the plan, the plan. coming out, and uh, we just finished a song with Cassius on that. Tank God's on that. Mama's on that. So it's gonna be a dope uh, a dope record. I hope people Little dig Mama, it. Little Mama podcast is gonna be great. I can't I'm wait telling for that. You, you are absolutely right. It it needs to start here. It, it's her time, man. She needs to come out with something fire and just like, yeah, she needs to hear it. She needs to hear that, like, it's her time. I think Iggy Azalea could have a second shot, too. Oh, for sure. They took her out the game pretty tough, but I feel like she, she could make a comeback oh, right yeah, now. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. I don't know why. Yeah, but I'm, a, I'm on the mama train right now. Fire. Me yeah. too, actually, yeah. Fuck Iggy. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right, yo, Drake, I really appreciate it. This is a fucking yeah, dope dude, conversation, thank you so man. Much. I'm glad we I'm glad that my you know sli- sliding in your DMs worked out. Hey cool. yeah. occasionally it does. I'm glad I checked that shit now because I at least like scroll through and try to like notice people's names now. Yeah, I always wonder like if I but i dude, honestly, I went and I hung out with Gary Vayner. Do you know Gary mm, Vaynerchuk? We did dude, he's podcast, like, oh, okay, yeah. sweet. So um yeah, I went and hung out with him and I just I just DM'd him one day. I was like, dude, I bet this guy's got so many DMs coming mm-hmm. in right now. There's no way he's going to read mine. And I DM'd him, and he responded, and I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, come out to New York. Let's sit down and have a meeting. And I'm like, dude, this is crazy. And he just was, you know, started saying to me, he's like, dude, you, you DM'd me. You got to me. Like, now do that to everybody you want to work with, anybody you want to get in touch with, anybody you want, you know. And, uh, and so I was just like, dude, and I've made so many – unbelievable connections like just going into it's like linkedin now you know yeah, it's like yeah. it's like just going into the dm and then meeting somebody and then creating a relationship and like tank god was the same thing i just got into his dms i was just like dude i love your productions i was watching his uh behind like i don't know what it's called but like his behind the music behind the song you know and uh was like dude i want to dm this guy like he's dope and I just DM'd him, and then he was like, oh, cool, I'm, I'm actually a fan of yours, too. And then I was like, dude, let's do a song together. Never going to happen. And he's like, okay. When you, I act, and, and it was crazy. Like, he actually had that week was the only week he had open for a session. And if I had DM'd him, in any, it's like this whole secret, weird, like, manifest, like, law of attraction thing. It's yeah. just like, you know, but you just have to apply it and actually do it. But it's cool. It works. Yeah. Hey. So it got me here. But don't be, the overall lesson, though, too, is don't be scared to shoot your shot because you might send 100 DMs and get two responses, but it's still two more connections than you had before. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the other thing, too, is like, you know, you send, you know, you get into seven or eight, 10, 20 DMs. And, and it's like, yeah, okay, everyone's not going to hit you back. But, dude, two or three of those people hit you back, and you're like, holy crap, how am I how am I sitting in a room with this person right now? This is rad. You, like, you know what happened to me? I fucking hit up Drake, told the other Drake, yeah, yeah, told yeah. him how much I love him or respect him. I'm not sure exactly what word I use. But then a couple weeks later, I made a video where I was just talking about, you know, uh, Trippy and Zan and Pump and, like, all these rappers I'm friends with yeah, who are doing so good. And I Reeves briefly Jr. mentioned, like, Happy you know, Trippy was in the studio with Drake Repost last week. This song. Drake, Thank that you. video got reposted by Worldstar. Drake saw it. He must have gone to see, he probably noticed I was following him or noticed that I had that DM and then he just immediately hit me back and he was just like, yo, like, I fuck with you. Dude. And I was just like, damn, like, the DM supplemented with me sort of complimenting him by just saying that it was dope the trip he was in the studio yeah. with him it's the it's, it's the law of attraction man it's like you manifest it you just it, it's whatever you whatever your mind thinks about all the time that's what you become and it's like it you know it's weird but you're kind of like a superhero and like a freaking you know 
you know, mm-hmm. Merlin, like, wizard or something. But it, and, and obviously you can't be like, okay, I'm going to think about this, and it appears. Mm-hmm. Obviously it takes time, and you have to apply, you know, actual work towards it. But like you said, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to DM, and then, you know what, hey, I'm going to talk about him on this thing, and then, and, oh, I'm around, you know, and then all of a sudden you're around someone who's around him, and then you realize that, honestly, at all times, you're only about six or seven degrees mm-hmm. away from anybody you want to get to in the world. Like, you know, you want to get to the president, well, not not now but like you know you, you want to get to the biggest you know ceo of of any corporation and you think oh man dude i that person's so far out of reach doesn't matter who you are you're really only like seven degrees away from mm. you know <clears throat> just applying yourself going into the right places going the right circles putting yourself in the right op- you know so that when opportunity hits you're like oh i'm ready for it and now it's here it's crazy and in terms of like works. practical advice for people too though i would say that like you hitting up tank god good ass idea yeah if you hit up metro Boomin, maybe a little bit harder to get a response you know so yeah, maybe yeah, true you know hitting up drake i'm talking about hitting up drake yeah maybe hit up like some rapper that you think is dope with twenty thousand followers or whatever or some and, producer that you know, that, you, know you, and that, you gotta that, climb your way up yeah i mean but also people, you know? also that's the thing too is like you look up a lot of these people that you want to work with like for me for example and you're like yeah pump's got 10 million followers but you know he wants big to head, fuck a girl but, I used to but, work with. <laughs> but big head, but big heads only got like, a big heads only got like twelve thousand. I mm. could pro- he might he might see my DM. Like, mm. all right, like I'll pro- he, I could probably get in with him. Like, producers are the key to everything because totally. rappers are nothing without producers. So if you can make a good relationship with the producer, a lot of times that could lead you into a lot of good situations. I yeah. have benefited from that many times. Yeah. Be good to your producers. Pay your producers. It's basically a bribe for what you're, they're going to help you with in the future. Yep, for sure. Hey, appreciate you coming through, man, so yeah, much. Yeah, dude, thank you so much for having us. This oh is God. really cool. So me and you cool. are seeing you guys. I know we've met before and everything, but hey, appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on, no, uh, on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes. We actually haven't updated the SoundCloud iTunes in a few weeks. I should probably get on that. And shout out to our sponsor, Vuz Vips. Yeah, and go check out my Gucci gang cover. Hey. Facts. <laughs> Smash the like button. Thank you, guys. I'm 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 I